Hi, everyone, and welcome back to day two of the Virtual Automation Summit. Um, good morning or afternoon or evening, whatever time it is where you are. Um, I would love if you could jump into the chat and say hello. Um, I'm curious where everybody is logging in from today. Uh, we had some folks from all over the world yesterday, and I want to see if we have the same today. In the meantime, while everybody starts chatting, I've got my coffee. I hope you've got yours. I'm curious, did anybody have anything like that was their favorite thing that they saw from yesterday or something that they took away, something that they learned that was new? Um, always excited to hear what people are learning when, uh, when we do something like this. Um, we have got a really exciting group of speakers today. We are going to talk a lot about AI. So that tells you a little bit about, you know, where the industry is moving. Oh, we've got somebody from Florida. I bet it is much warmer and much sunnier in Florida than where it is here in Cleveland. Um, what is it like here today? Let's see. I haven't gone outside yet. Well, let's be honest. I don't go outside very much. Oh, actually, it's pretty warm. It's almost 60. 60 in December. How did that happen? Um, but yeah, it's probably still warmer in Florida. <laughs> um, is South Florida like Miami kind of area? Did you did you take my beloved LeBron James from me? <laughs> or a different part of Southern Florida? And I might have the geography wrong, by the way. I'm not great with that. <laughs> But yeah, we've got um, we've got some speakers talking about AI. Quite a few people, actually, um, myself and others. Um, we've got some interesting things coming up around uh, continuous testing and DevOps. I'm super excited for that because DevOps is kind of on my list of things I want to learn more about for um, for 2022, along with a bunch of other things. But um, definitely getting more deeply engaged in. Um, and building pipelines and understanding how pipelines work um, is definitely a big part of part of what I'm I'm excited to learn on my 2022 personal roadmap. Yeah, so Flirt Ladder to help. Yep, LeBron was down there. I forgive you. It's okay. Uh, he'll he'll always be our hometown boy, even when he's not here. <laughs> you have to understand for folks who aren't familiar with the Cleveland area. People from Buffalo like to say that they're from the home of bad sports. No, no. I am from the home of bad sports. I mean, the Browns really were on like a playoff trajectory, almost beat the Chiefs, which was huge, and then uh, just fell apart. <laughs> just couldn't keep it together. And now um, like a third of our locker room has COVID and can't play the next game. So we are probably not making the playoffs. So yeah, when Clevelanders have a sport, an athlete that they love, we, we kind of latch on to them <laughs> and claim them forever. Even though he actually is from here, he grew up in Akron, which is right next to Cleveland. It's practically like a mini city next to Cleveland. But anyway, for people who don't care about sports, you probably don't have much interest in what I'm rambling about. Um, but yeah, so I love seeing where everybody is from um, around the world. So who is something they learned yesterday that they were excited about learning? I'm curious what everybody, what everybody discovered, learned, took away from yesterday. And I am going to, okay. Um, yeah, so we've got a great group of speakers. We've got a lot of cool things coming. Um, we are just getting ready to bring on our first person as soon as he is all set. Does anybody have a talk today that they're excited about seeing? Something that's on the list that you're you're really excited to get to see um, or hear about? Um, how about, does anybody have anything on the roadmap or on their uh, personal 2022, like learning plan that they've picked up that they're excited to start learning about for next year? Like I said, I've got DevOps on mine. 
because I have this new role, I've got a lot more about product ownership that I'm, I'm excited about learning um, that I really haven't had a chance to dig into yet. Although I just product ownership that I'm, I just downloaded a whole bunch of virtual or a whole bunch of audio books um, yesterday from Audible about um, leadership and about product ownership and all of that really cool stuff um, that I need to that I need to really start digging into. Testing and production. So I have a funny story um, about testing and production that I'll have to tell you later um, because our first speaker is all ready to go and I don't want to keep rambling <laughs> because I'm sure you're here to hear all of the great talks. Um, so I am really, really excited to introduce Nikolaj to everybody. Um, Nikolaj is going to be talking about Nikolaj, I just lost your talk because Chrome decided it was going to crash on me. So <laughs> I'm going to have you share your what your talk title is. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction, Jenna. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about full stack test automation. Uh, so awesome. Yeah. I'm very excited for this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you. OK, great. So <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, have you ever had um, a task of automating everything on UI end-to-end -end test automation layer? Probably you thought, that, oh, yes, I'm going to have work cut out for me for a long time because that's a lot of work. Or maybe you're thinking, is it the best layer to have full stack of test automation on? Well, in this talk, we're going to be talking about the, the full stack transformation, not like one layer who's responsible for automation, but like how can we utilize every layer we have in our control to actually have a best destination solution ever. So uh, let's dive into it. So throughout this whole presentation, you're going to be hearing a bug filter concept. So basically, it's just an idea how we can structure our destination layer. So it would be just like a filter. So we're going to go through our application. We'll go through those filters. And some of the specific bugs in each of the layer are going to be picked up. And we're going to have distilled version of application free of bugs. Well, that's theory, at least. And we can't talk about automation without thinking or touching the testing pyramid, right? So this is the one, like this is written by my Cohen in a forgotten layer of test automation pyramid. So, and it was trying to produce like, or promote the layer of service layer because a lot of like UI testing was happening and testing was happening at service layer, not so much. So he wanted to promote that, but uh, yeah, eventually this evolved into something else, something bigger. Uh, like test permit automation was dropped from there like manual testing happening a lot of other layers it was put in, into that like there's even one for machine learning again and when people look at this they are knowing that they need to write less ui tests than unit tests so basically this is some kind of ratio layers how we can structure our test automation but is it a good like strategy? Can you use it as a strategy for every UI test? I need to write two API tests. Does it make sense? It's a nice output of your testing strategy, but it doesn't fuel you, like how you can approach automation. But there is another one which might be more useful, and this is a bug filter by Noah Sussman. So <clears throat> his idea is that you have infinite set of possible known bugs, and this is an application with infused bugs, and then you run through unit test layer, you basically can pick up some of the bugs. Uh, and by unit testing, you can test in backend, like uh, <clears throat> server side, you can test logic, behavior, some kind of like actions happening be behind the scenes. Also, there's unit tests on client side, like all the modern uh, like frameworks have them, like Angular and React, they have unit testing capabilities, such as like, if you have a form, you can take that component and you can test validation for each of the fields. You can test the form submitting, like is required fields are, uh, if you are not filled, are they disallowing you to submit that form? Also, if you select something from a drawdown or a checkbox, another field might be becoming disabled. All of that can be tested in unit test layer. That's much faster and you don't need to write end-to-end tests for each of those cases. So, it, so <clears throat> by utilizing that, you can probably sort out and find majority of bugs in your application, combining UI and backend test, unit test. So when you utilize that layer, some bugs can't be caught with unit testing. And this is when you go to the integration layer. There is something like 
how the back end and client side actually integrating. Is it working as a holistic approach? Is a database working? Is the components in, inside the application working and behaving as you expected? So those are requiring integration kind of tests to make sure that they are working and they're still don't, like, don't have any bugs. Later, you can reuse end-to-end -end tests for the bugs you can't find with unit and integration tests, but only for the, to find those specific bugs. And this leaves us with not so much cases to cover because a lot of things have covered in unit tests and integration tests. And what's happening if you are covering the same thing, like the same logic, uh, same uh, acceptance criteria, both in unit tests and in end-to-end tests? The thing is that unit tests are running first. So if you have a build, it's built and it's actually tested. That means that that bug is going to be found in, in that stage and it will not go past it. It will not be deployed to an environment where we can run end to test. It will need to be fixed first before it proceeds. So basically that bug will be fixed before end to end test even have the ability to catch them. So if you write the same thing, cover the same thing on end to end test as a unit test, the end to end tests are well, useless. It's an extra cost, it's an extra maintenance, it's extra thing to care about and, and actually prolong the duration of your whole automation suite. So if you can avoid to actually adding more tests and end and end layer and add more into unit test, that would be more well, smarter decision to do. And by doing this, you actually end up with the, this perfect pyramid of, uh, <clears throat> of like testing layers because you only cover everything on unit test on only what's not covered in unit test, you cover it integration and then the end to end test. And at the bottom of that layer is the human testing. So when you run all your automation, the human testing steps in and they can find edge cases, specific bugs, maybe some like colors or like accessibility bugs, all of the things can which end to end test and like all the rest of the layers can't find. So you might be thinking, well, I've seen this before. Yeah, the, it, it's kind of depicting this like anti pattern of ice, ice cream cone, but this is different layers. Like uh, that on top layer is a manual test, mm -hmm. and then uh, the biggest layer of testing pyramid is end to end test, and the lowest one, the smallest one, is unit test. In this one, it's still it's still the normal test automation. Like this pyramid, these layers are still the same as as before. But just thinking about like from bug perspective, but Let's take another look at this from the top. And from the top, it might look like a bug net where we have some kind of a coverage with unit tests. So they're covering some parts of the system, but there's still gaps. And we can come up with this test from like checklists, from acceptance criteria, from user stories, from behavior, and we can check them in unit tests. When developers are finished, then usually test engineers can start working on some kind of end to end tests. And they usually assume that nothing is covered in unit tests. Like it doesn't exist. So we need to do everything from a scratch. So we're duplicating the same effort. We're still using the same source for our unit UI test. We use checklists and we use uh, acceptance, acceptance criteria. And we end up at this one. So probably you can't see, but if I zoom good enough, you see that there is an extra line, a yellow one. And this is end to end test. We're basically duplicating the effort. Yes, we're adding a little bit of coverage with system level like tests, but it's not that much. We're testing the same thing. And if there's a bug in this specific acceptance criteria or checklist, unit tests will find them first. It will never reach end to end test layer. So that will be well useless. So what we should do that should, should do instead is that actually trying to find what's covered with other layers like unit tests and integration tests, and then write appropriate API and UI tests to cover those gaps. That would be the most useful thing we can do, not to overlap and duplicate all the effort, but just smartly think what can be tested with other layers. And we just add just the things we need, not more, just what we need. And this brings us to the full stack test automation approach. It's like it's the same pyramid, but what we do, we synchronize all the layers. They kind of aware of each other, what's covering what, and we only write the ones we need, extra ones. And usually this pyramid looks like that, right? From a responsibility perspective, there's UI test, very API test, and unit integration. Unit integration, well, they are kind of developer responsibility. They write the code, they write unit test, and integration test. That's it. Rest of them usually are fall into test engineers and QA's responsibility to maintain and develop. And the 
worst thing about it that usually there's a really big gap between those and even like a wall like we don't care what unit tests are like testing we, we mistrust them also developers don't care what other layers are testing and well frankly speaking they shouldn't their goal is to write as many coverage in unit tests as it's possible and the rest layer should be actually integrating in what's already covered and like thinking about it and only covering what's extra so basically, it's test engineer's responsibility to look what's in, what's already covered, and then design the API and UI testers, which are like covering the gaps, not like all thing altogether, like duplicating everything. And <clears throat> maybe you have seen this before, like when API tests are smaller than UI tests, and you have more UI tests than API tests, or none of the API tests as well. Like I've been here. I like thought that if we have one framework, why should we have two frameworks to support? Like, why do we need API testing? Let's do everything on UI. Uh, what can go wrong, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so sticking back to the to this idea. So test engineers, if they want to keep that responsibility of API and UI tests and still be efficient, they start. They need to start thinking what developers are doing, and that's actually not that hard because these two areas are already merging. Developers are doing unit tests. That's kind of a testing. The uh, following checklist, maybe a checking using checklist before we submit that, uh, like finishing the user story. They do code reviews and test engineers as well. They're moving to developer perspective. They are using more sophisticated tools, which requires scripting and developing. Maybe some uh, areas like security testing, performance testing, those are requiring more and more technical knowledge. Also, they are writing end-to-end -end tests and API tests as well. This requires scripting, sometimes even multiple languages and like various ones. So test engineers do going into that area as well. And in that union, really interesting things happen. Then uh, people who are like both know test engineer perspective and developer perspective can come up with the solutions which are well unseen of like outside the box for any of those uh, other areas. We can't see the solution, but this person who knows both of these areas can come up with this. And like full stack transformation, it might not make sense from developer perspective and also test engineer perspective, but someone in between could come up with this idea. Like, like full stack transformation is not a new thing. It's like, it's been talked about a long, a long, for a long time, but it's not like maybe not in similar name, but it's, it's a not a new theory, but people are coming up with that. And like usually the generalist, who are both can do developer and test engineer perspective can come up with this idea. So we need to start moving to developer area more and more. So why don't we look at the unit tests? And this is one of the examples. And they're usually really small, really checking like, like atomic, checking one functionality only. And you've probably seen this before. It's like really familiar. The it framework, like assertions, all of that are used from other frameworks as well. Like, like uh, Jest is using the same thing. Like, it's really familiar. And if developers are writing proper function and method and variable names, it's really easy to read that code to understand what it's actually doing. So we can move up a level and maybe look at the whole suite. <clears throat> Builder, firm settings, detailed component. There's a few sections. One of them is basic. Should create, okay. Uh, there's another section for init. Should assign filler firm settings. Should call, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of complicated, isn't it? Um, and the thing is, why it's happening is because developers, when they write unit tests, they think about the code. They look at the code, they look at the variables, which are, which are changing by the functions, by the methods. Then they look at the methods and how to call them, how to run them, because one of the main reasons the, to calculate what's the like better coverage is unit test coverage. And this is actually, if you mistreat it, you can run into really big problems. Like if you look at the code, this in this specific example, it's like there's a function and it takes one of array and there's like three variables there inside of it and it's bool value. So basically in order to test everything, this is the whole like array you need to use of test data in order to check everything to have 100% coverage. But if you look at it, not from functionality perspective, not from acceptance criteria, not from checklist, but just as a plain code, you can end up with only two of these. Like you run everything with true and you run everything with false and you have 100% coverage. This functionality might not even been working. These two test like cases might not be even existing. 
and you will have 100% coverage. And this is one of the criteria to pass your like code reviews, to have at least 70, 80, 90, or more percent of coverage. It doesn't mean anything. There might be not even any offer asserts there because how code coverage is working is that there's some kind of a watcher for every line of code and you run, run your uh, unit test and basically saying you, yeah, this line of code was executed. It doesn't have to be asserted that it's working. It just have to be executed. If there's no internal server error, that's fine. That's it. This is working. So there's a lot of caveats with this unit test coverage and a lot of things that can go wrong. This is why we as a test engineers, we need to go and help developers to develop better skills in writing tests. They have to think about the functionality. Maybe this is some kind of like permission layers. Like there's permission to view dashboard, to view sales, to view reporting. Maybe that true, true, true is not existing. That's not the actual user. Maybe super admin, maybe. And a false, 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 that doesn't exist. That at least one permission has to be, have to be in there. So if you think from functionality perspective, that might be a different story, how much you need to test, how much is actually tested. But it's not all bad things with code coverage. There's a good things as well. Uh, like it gives you really good information of what's not covered. So basically, if you, you have like a set of uh, tests, which are testing behavior from checklist, you basically run those and you can look at what lines of code were not tested. Maybe you forgot some kind of edge case. Maybe you forgot some kind of like critical functionality, which you, oh yeah, that's what's existed as well. So you can write more test cases based on what's not covered. Or maybe that part of code is, well, never used. Maybe you just need to delete that and don't keep it in the code. So a lot of things from what's not covered can come up out of from code coverage, but what's covered, it doesn't mean a lot actually, it could be nothing. So coming back to this example, so we basically were looking at the code, what the methods are, what the variable names are, and we were just changing variables, doing something with code, without actually understanding what this means, how it actually affects the system. So this is not the test cases, this is more like, you know, our variables are working, our methods working, but for end user, it doesn't mean a lot. So this is another example. And this is both of these are from actual uh, projects in our organization. So this one is a, also a UI unit test, like a client side unit test, more like, more like integration one, but anyway. So here's like team capacity forecast report. And there's a few sections, one from a plan hire, one from employee, and then plan hire should take plan hire date from newer capacity should correctly resolve plan hire department, organization unit, and competence. Well, that makes sense. If I would be working in that project, if I had the domain, domain of that project, I would understand what we are actually testing. I could use that when developing what other test cases I need to have in API or in end test layer. And actually, this is a snippet from a comment. Inside the user story, when developer finished developing, like implementing it, he's post the snippet of what unit tests are written. So test engineers can look at that, maybe come up with edge cases, come up with more cases, maybe come up with uh, like sharing their checklist beforehand. And so that could be added into uh, this coverage as well. So you as a test engineer, you can bring so much into unit testing just to help, just to ask good questions like, what is this actually testing? This will help them to think like, mm, I don't know, but maybe you should know what you're testing. Maybe you should uh, could use some kind of user stories to come up with the testing, maybe checklist, maybe you can help them come up with the good test cases. So uh, one of the exercises you can take for next time to start your journey into like uh, looking at what unit testing is, and you can look at the <clears throat> bug fix for next time you will have a bug fix. You go to the pull request and you look at what have been changed. Is there any unit test written? Is there anyone like you, all the unit tests changed? So they would find that bug before it's actually introduced. So the thing is that if you have a bug, that means that coverage, which is like in unit testing or integration layer, wasn't good enough. There was gaps and bugs occur. So maybe every time when you have a bug, you should have unit tests to find it first and then fix, then fix this bug. And then you will be able to uh, move on further. Why specifically the bug fixes? Because, well, it's a really small scope. Like it's, uh, it's a few lines of code usually and then unit test. It's easy to understand to have a greater like scope what's actually changing. If you take 13 point story point uh, user story, 
uh, to actually go and check how units are written, that might be too much, like multiple passes, multiple lines of code. This just might be too much to start this journey. So <clears throat> you should start looking at those pull requests and looking at unit tests. It's not that hard, and you can actually do a lot of good for, for the project and cut the scope from automation if you can cover that in unit testing. So getting back to the actual full stack transformation, how can it work in reality? How can we utilize all these layers and keep them synchronized throughout the whole project? So option A is the developers are writing unit and integration tests then they know what they covered already and what's not covered so they can write API test if it's required and then write UI test if it's again required. Uh, option B is the developer writes unit test integration test and then, then writes specs of like specifications of what needs to be covered with API and unit test, UI test. Then the test engineer come in and according to a specification write the missing tests. Option C, developers saying like, you know what? It doesn't sound like my responsibility. Or it doesn't sound like my problem. I'm just gonna still write the unit test, but you will need to go and analyze what's being covered, do the extra work, and then and like and then create the missing API and UI test. So the whole table would look like this. Option A is well, the most efficient one. There's no carryover. There's no transfer of knowledge. There's no bottlenecks. The person starts working on it and it can finish that. The rest of options are more complicated, but they're still doable. So there might be more option D. Like right now in the project I'm working in, how we approach this is that we have a lot of legacy code, like something that we inherited. And we have the pages like prioritized, like which are more important. We start with that single page. We'll look at what the functionality has, is there, like what the functions, what the user expects to do. Maybe there's some kind of checklist. We come up with every test case we can think of, like what can go wrong and what needs to be working for this specific page. And we split into what can be tested with unit tests, what can be tested with backend unit tests, what can be tested with API and UI tests. And then we look at what's already covered and then add those missing uh, unit tests, API tests, and end-to-end tests. This is how we can still, even for legacy code, approach with this full stack automation and don't overlap a lot of testing. So <clears throat> this can help us slow, like, like not slow down, but like uh, fasten the way how we can uh, change the page, like uh, cover these pages. So when we finish with one page, when we move, like implement everything, when we move it to another page from the highest priority list. For the actual things that we are working right now, like new functionality, for backend developers, their responsibility are to write UI and units and, and integration tests, and also if they need to write API tests which are required by what, if they think that it's required. For uh, for front-end developers, they need to write units and integration tests as well. But if they see that they need to some another layer, they can use end-to-end tests. Basically, that end-to-end test, they don't need to use it that much. It's just for new pages that it's accessible from UI. It's like the page is loading. Uh, maybe there's a table. The table is displaying the data that we are like we need, and that would be in the end of like end time test. Everything else, like logic, everything can be tested with unit unit integration test. So this is how we can build up this uh, full stack automation approach, even with the diff different teams. And test engineers can help with each of those layers and each of the test cases. So maybe there is another option which would work in your specific project with your specific skill set and your like teammates so it's really depending on what the approach you're going to take so looking back at this bug filter there's another piece <clears throat> like on the bottom of that after all the automated tests there's a human testing so it means like or it implies that you need to run all the automated tests you, you have before you start human testing because if the end-to-end -end test or integration or human test can catch that bug before you have to check it out, uh, find it, and, and then report it, it's easier if they do that. So if already that is written, you should use them. So how to utilize it even more? This specific human layer is that human testing layer is the parallel builds. This is just an idea uh, which we can use in like in this modern age. Uh, so there's a pipelines which are like with each of the build have to go through, and one of them is to deploy to some kind of environment and run automated tests. So if you have multiple builds and only one environment, you will need to wait a long time before they actually checked. And it could be a really big bottleneck, depending on how long does it take to run all the regression suite. 
So what you can do for that is simply you can use this modern tool set of uh, Kubernetes uh, containers, containers uh, and actually ask orchestrator for to build you an environment whenever you have a new build. So you have a build, you ask for orchestrator to create an environment, you deploy all the newest version to it, and then you run API and UI tests against it. If you have another build, no problem, create another environment and dynamically create it, and then you don't have a bottleneck. And when it's finished, it's finished. So that what it helps you is that it doesn't, it, it have constant time when it's finished testing. If it's an hour, that's fine. It's going to be finished after one hour when you launch it. If you have this one environment, that might be like five hours if you have five builds piled up. So in this one, you will have it in one hour all the time. So what you can do is that every time when you have a pull request created, you can launch this. You can start testing that pull request, like that build, before you finish the code review. So that like that it might take more than an hour, and you will have a feedback from all your automated tests before that pull request is finished reviewing. And this would increase the return on investment on the whole automation because you will be running it more often, not only nightly when like, you have time, but on all the builds and only when they passing. And if it have really great coverage, you will have a lot of information that it's that didn't break any kind of functionality elsewhere. So you can just focus on the current new functionality. So it's a nice theory. We haven't used it yet, but it's something that we we probably should start thinking. If we don't know about it, when we can't come up with that idea. But if you knew about it, you can ask your DevOps engineers or infrastructure engineers to actually come up with this solution and make it work. So this brings us to the summary. And one of the first items I want to reiterate that this automation permit, that static model ratio, it's not the strategy. It's an outcome of a good automation strategy. But filter might be a good strategy because it allows you to focus not only like the functionality, like I need to test everything. No, it's more of a like risk-based approach when you think of what can go wrong, what are the places which might be affected, and what I need to test to make sure that it's still working. So if we have, uh, for example, we have a, a page with a table where there is displaying uh, uh, the inventory items in, in warehouse, then another page displaying items which are available in the store, and the third page which are already sold. This might be tested from like automation perspective. All of them can be tested separately with the data, with the logic, how we move items from one list to another. Like if it's sold, it should be in another list. You can do that, yes, but if you can think about what can go wrong, you can start thinking like, hey, this is the same table. This is like the same component reused from all of these three pages. And if we can test it separately, like I can add column for text, column for uh, like uh, amount, column for percentage. I can do sorting, filtering with that. I can sure, make sure that it's working on the unit test on the client side unit tests before, like, I don't need to write intent test expensive ones to test that functionality on each of the page. I know it's the same component. Why don't I just test it separately? Then from an API perspective, I also know that it's the same endpoint, just different filters, like what type of items you should return to that. You can test that with, with API tests. You can ask them to return a specific list, then in the back end change something like sell, sell something and make sure that it's actually working. And then all the logic, all the edge cases, all of this like transfers, like how the items are operating, you can test in unit test layer easily. So this will save a lot of scope. This is, will save a lot of unnecessary tests. If you can think of this like from bug filter perspective, what can go wrong and how can I prevent that? So this will still uh, like, require you to look at the unit test. You need to understand how they work, what are the capabilities of that, and how you can utilize that. And well, Sherman should take care of a full stack estimation. If there is no owner, you will still have a wall where you don't care about each other, what, what, like, like what tests are written in unit tests, what tests are written in API tests. You need to come up with like owner for that. Maybe you yourself can be the owner who will synchronize all the layers and make sure we are moving on like more effectively rather than just like recreating all the coverage. And you need to remove bottlenecks from your pipeline. If you see something that's like blocking you, like 
we are living in really modern age where the tools are so advanced that we can just probably we can't come up with all of the use cases we already can solve this. We just need to think of that how could you utilize that? Because if we remove the bot bottlenecks from pipelines and we can run end-to-end -end test and API test on every build, that would increase its return on investment. So it will be would be easier sell to invest more into automation because what we're running them on every build. It's like giving us value not only nightly or not only before release but on every build so yeah with that i think i think that's it uh thank you for listening uh, if you have any questions or success stories on how you're actually implementing that uh, in your organization i would be glad to hear that uh, so you can contact me in linkedin uh, so yeah uh, and maybe any questions Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat and I've got some thoughts for you as well in case um, no other questions come in. But please, 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 if you have a question, drop it in the chat so that we can answer it live. Um, so Julia says, thank you for the great talk. Um, how do you communicate to devs what should be tested? Constantly checking their PRs or maybe use test cases written in business language or what process do you recommend? Yeah, well, one of the ways how we solved it uh, or trying to solve it is that we, we talk about what should be the, the coverage, how we should look like from moving from code coverage, moving into more like behavior coverage. And we're asking test engineers to provide checklists uh, before the like implementation is started. So they can maybe even marking which could be a perfect unit test. And then developers can use that when for unit testing actually purpose. And and I think by giving, it, giving them feedback, over the time we will get like because like this idea like i was surprised how much like how acceptable they were to this idea because it makes sense to not duplicate everything just like you need to know what you're covering in before those tests and then cover like gaps not like everything from the beginning not that duplicating everything so they're like they're person who are like people who knows like like numbers and like rules and algorithms we will get it and we were going to do something to help you out with that. So it's really easy. And like, I think it's like, I love this collaboration aspect. Like when you don't, like when you uh, helping them, they helping you to understand the unit test, you're giving them feedback. They're like helping you to write better end-to-end -end tests and, and API tests. It's just such a great collaboration. I think this is one of the like hidden parts of that. So it's not, there's no golden rule to do that, but you need to communicate and then like, talk about it and maybe help them out uh, maybe have a good arguments how to actually implement that. So <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's actually answered the question. I, I think you did. Yeah. Um, Thanks. And when you talk about shifting away from code coverage, I completely agree. I've had more conversations than I can count lately about how little value code coverage actually gives us. Um, and we, I want to, and I hope you agree, shift the conversation from code coverage to value coverage. Have we covered what, what delivers value? Because code yeah. coverage is arbitrary. Value coverage means that we're delivering something that matters. Um, so I don't know, just something like that. Um, <laughs> uh, Julio also asked uh, if you could make some recommendations on your favorite API testing tools. Well, it's... It's uh, there is no favorite. It, basically, in the current situation, how we like because we want to shift API testing for developers, backend developers, we usually need to synchronize with what we're using, so we would be more comfortable. If it's like C sharp, then maybe JavaScript wouldn't be the best uh, framework to use to them. But there's a lot of uh, like tools out there. Uh, Axios is like very often used in like, and I, I use this as well. So it's one of the better ones, but it doesn't have to be a rule. It's just like, it's just a helper to you. Like there is like idea and approach is more important than tooling. Like, like this isn't like an agile, like people and like, this is more important than tooling. So. And the API testing tools you use are really going to depend on if this is for you, Julia, as a, as a tester and maybe you're new to API testing, you may want to choose a tool that has some learning built in. If you are really advanced and you've been doing this for a long time, you would maybe use an IDE. So 
Um, Cause some people say like, you know, this particular tool is my favorite, but I think it depends on what you're doing, right? Um, and where you are. Um, any, I wanna give a last chance for questions. Uh, before we shift over to our next talk, actually, I think we have a little bit of time. I think we might be ahead of schedule. Yeah, we do have a little bit more time. Do you have well, any? We started other... early. We did start early. Yeah. We started early. Um, do you have any other kind of thoughts you wanted to share? Mm. Whoa, okay, you caught me off guard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't anything prepared yet, uh, but. Um... That's okay. Yeah, I think like like this idea of like curiosity. Uh, you, you need to be kind of curious. You need to go and like uh, try to make sense of things. Like if you're afraid of something, like unit testing is so scary. I I don't understand what they're doing in there, but but like it it you should try at least. You you should come up with the easy steps how you can go to that. Try that experience before you're like uh, giving up doing that but, but so curiosity is one of the things that would allow you to grow as a specialist like what about this one how about this tool how about another tool how about this approach but what's new in the market so you're always going to find something interesting and will allow you to grow as a specialist and you would be well you would be ahead, ahead of a curve i guess so that's that's always good and if this is new for you and i'm speaking as somebody who went from zero coding to a little bit of coding um even if you don't do it, like even if you have no experience, go sit down at, at a group code review, be a part of it um, because you'll pick things up. It'll give you, it'll give you that chance to be curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, starting point, yeah. Um, thank you so much, that was great. And I think there's a ton of takeaways. I think people are gonna go back and rewatch this. I'm gonna go back and rewatch it um, because you know I wanna see it a second time. And I especially love that you brought in uh, Noah's um, Noah's diagram that he uses because I'm a big fan of his work. <laughs> so thank yeah. you so much, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. And uh, have a nice rest of the presentations. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye. Um, so that was fantastic. A great way to kick off the day. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Thomas Fellman. Um, and I'm specifically saying his last name because if you have earned a PhD, you get to have everybody refer to you as doctor because it's a huge accomplishment. Um, <laughs> I love getting to say that for people. Um, and I'm very excited about um, about what you're talking about because I mentioned yesterday that like I've, I've trained testers and my heart is for juniors and for beginners. So anything talking about starting is always excited, exciting for me. So uh, Dr. Thomas Fellman's talk is Art for Beginners, Autonomous Real-Time Testing for Cyber Physical Products. Um, so I'm always excited when it's about learning new things. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Is the mic okay as it is? It is, yeah, we can hear Okay, you. okay, okay. This is uh, always a little bit uh, difficult depending upon the Zoom tool or whatever it is, it might depend. So, uh, yes, it's for beginners what I'm uh, talking about. Um, but I must also say that, uh, well, uh, that uh, it is uh, something, well, uh, autonomous real time testing is something for people who actually love and accept to uh, look. Uh, at various different disciplines and mix things together which you don't easily uh, mix, for instance, as we do mathematical logic and uh, uh, marketing user needs. So I hope you'll enjoy it. So um, art naturally is something uh, beautiful. Uh, I'll show you first of all uh, <laughs> Where I'm coming from, actually, yes, I'm not a beginner. I made my doctor thesis many, many, many years ago, namely 40 years. And <laughs> it was uh, about mathematics. At the time, uh, computers looked like a DEC 10 or a PDP 11, something uh, which you nowadays uh, would uh, uh, think it, uh, it's right for the museum. Actually, it is right for the museum. 
and we were very proud when we had uh, the uh, memory capacity of our computer, interactive computer, augmented from half a megabyte to one megabyte. That was those old times. But in, in between, I made uh, a lot of other things, such as Six Sigma for software, a quality function deployment, um, CMMI, Net Promoter. Net Promoter is probably something uh, which you, well, most of it you probably haven't, haven't even heard of, but Net Promoter is all this kind of uh, asking people whether they would dare to recommend something or not. So and that's where I actually live. You see down under the... Uh, under these hills, uh, it's a wonderful place, but at the moment, uh, you it wouldn't look like this. It is uh, just foggy and it's uh, cold and it's uh, uh, December. My collaborator, Marcel, actually is mastermind in uh, most of the things which I will uh, mention, uh, such as uh, virtualization, cloud contained, serverless, machine learning, Docker and Kubernetes, Internet of Things, and so on. So um, his contribution is very uh, substantial to this presentation. So let me just start with the goals. I hope that I can explain you why software testing is an autonomous activity which goes parallel to DevOps and not something which is shift left and shift right or or in between like dev test ops or this dev, 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 I don't know. No, it's an autonomous activity and it is uh, as important as developing a product. So it is uh, something which goes in parallel and it is model based. Software testing is not just testing code. No, the code is, is certainly important, but today we don't have always code. We have services and the services come from the cloud and the, uh, we have no access to code. So uh, all we can do when we do testing is actually mo must be model-based. Otherwise, we probably the testing the wrong things. Naturally, uh, it's not wrong to test code. Every code which, uh, uh, which exists is something that must have undergone some test that actually delivers something well known, but what it actually delivers is uh, uh, possible also exploratory. Test cases can be automatically generated and selected for relevance using combinatorial logic and user values. So here you see the combinatorial logic, which is uh, from my mathematical background as a logician, mathematical logic, and user's values is from the marketing side of my background, which I have shown you. Uh, Net Promoter Score, for instance, is uh, uh, something that measures users' values or tries to measure users' values. And we are using users' values in order to automate tests. So test cases can be executed automatically. This is uh, something which uh, uh, required the help of my friend Marcel, actually, uh, using Kubernetes custom resources and digital twins. And finally, uh, the goal Continuous software testing is the most important activity in the DevOps to create confidence in cyber physical products. So, what are cyber physical products? Well, let me start with autonomous testing. Uh, well, there was upon a time when steam power was the most advanced technology. Um, with mechanical production, railways and so on. Then came electricity. Uh, we had testers here trying to find out whether there is actually current or not. Oh, yes, there is. Uh, then came the silicon microprocessors information technology and uh, fast Fourier transform, electronics in the fast Fourier transform, by the way, um, who knows why we can see uh, this, all these images in the internet. Oh yeah, fast Fourier transform was invented in 1977. Um, 
Before that, uh, there was a strict uh, limitation of computers to numerical processing. So, and uh, nowadays we are gone in the four, fourth industrial revolution, namely the revolution where we have cyber physical systems. And I will actually talking much about testing of cyber physical systems. And you will see that testing cyber physical systems is quite a bit different from testing silicon microprocessors. And something which is really, which I really think uh, uh, makes me a little bit uh, uh, also difficult to understand, difficult to communicate, because uh, the move between the third and the fourth generation of industrial revolution is not yet understood. This is something that currently goes. Well, what's the problem with cyber physical systems? Hmm. Would you ever dare to use an autonomous vehicle? Sit in such a car and let you drive through the streets of Kiev or uh, New York or uh, Napoli? <laughs> well, uh, you have software updates every 10 days, you have connected with smartphones, you have cloud services, and the car learns new behavior. It's a quite a difference to uh, old-fashioned software that behaves according to the code that programs it. Or if, say, in the area of COVID, you can uh, ask yourself whether you trust a medical instrument. Also, software updates every 10 days, connects with healthcare systems of various antiquity, uh, and uses artificial intelligence to analyze what it sees. How would you test such things? Well, let me first uh, show you a, a little bit the thought about continuous integration, continuous deployment, the, the famous DevOps. That was DevOps as it originally looked like. You create something, build, test, release, deploy, operate, monitor. Today we have uh, an understanding that actually uh, testing should be <laughs> shift left, shifted left, as uh, some people take, uh, take it and say, well, you should start actually with the test from the very beginning in the creation phase and, uh, 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 well, and then, and then, and then you, de you deploy and the uh, testing finishes? No. Autonomous real-time testing means you never stop testing. The test continues while the cyber physical systems remains in operation. It's even more important that you continue like that because if the cyber physical system learns something, it can also unlearn. Like humans, we also unlearn. Uh, try, for instance, uh, uh, to, to uh, use a, a phone or fax service nowadays with uh, young people. They look at it, they have unlearned how to do it. And uh, our cyber physical systems can learn as well. So you should be very careful about including uh, the operational part of DevOps into testing. But how can this be done? Um, well, uh, just to say short, autonomous real-time testing, it's ART, ART, uh, tests run anytime, anywhere, in a limited time slot, and individually. Say, so I'm thinking of a car uh, parked in a garage or in a parking lot, and while it's being updated with new software releases, they run certain tests autonomously on the car, and the tests are even adapted individually to uh, what the car usually experiences. So this is what I understand as autonomous testing, new approach. Um, but this is not so simple. It, you cannot simply uh, record your uh, automated tests and play them on the car, because the car, it has uh, devices, it has cameras, it has lidars, it has... Uh, 
uh, it, it has a, a motor, it, an engine, uh, uh, steering, uh, a, a lot of uh, functionalities which actually um, uh, should be tested somehow. So first of all, what should we do with all the functionality? The problem with test automation is that we uh, can probably really automate the test only functionality. Naturally, you can do an UI test and, uh, and then see whether uh, the new version of the, pro of the program simply uh, produces the same UI as, uh, as before. And this you can do uh, automatically, uh, but uh, probably um, at the end, the UI test is uh, more something that uh, is tested by humans and not by robots. And we are talking here about uh, autonomous testing by uh, robots, by uh, uh, software testing itself. Or if you, or you will see artificial intelligence that tests artificial intelligence. Um, the problem with test automation is you must be able to measure if you can't measure functionality, you don't do automation. If you can't test measure test size, how should you be able to uh, make sure that you're actually going to test functionality? Which functionality you're going to test? So this is probably my very first uh, uh, thing that I want to uh, to urge you. Really, in, this is really important. If you do not use functional size measurement, you can't do testing right. And I know that uh, very few people actually uh, actually employ functional size measurement uh, uh, because they don't simply they don't know it or they don't know for what it's good for. Um, in fact, functional size measurement is in the version that I'm using for testing is looking after the data movements and <clears throat> it counts the number of data movements as a size and for this it uses a simplifying UML model. So testers and developers can walk the data movements when planning or executing tests. You see it already here. Uh, if I, what I wrote here, functional process, some device, other devices, other app, it is not code testing that we do here. We really test what the functionality provides. We can test on any level. We do not need to go always on the deepest level. If we, if we, for instance, want to test whether a car behaves correctly when he encounters a child playing with a football, for instance. Um, but here we use uh, a standard from ISO the 19761 COSMIC, which allows to model software uh, by its uh, functionality and counting it as size. The count itself is less important than to understand how you describe functionality in a standardized, easy way, which can be tested. So if you can do that, then uh, uh, you can say functional size compared to test size. Com and uh, you can uh, speak about test coverage in a, uh, in a well-defined manner, namely test coverage is very simply which test stories cover which user stories. And the way that they combine are the functional size data movements. Actually, there is a problem with test size. So if you have uh, old-fashioned third-generation software, commercial, administrative, you probably have a function size of, well, 5,000. That can that, that is typically for administration, 5,000 uh, function points. Uh, with a test intensity of 10 gives you a total test size of 50,000 function points. That is, you have to write tests that cover 50,000 uh, uh, data movements. And, uh, uh, well, that is, in average, 10 times every data movement. Yes. Well, that's a work which is uh, impressive, uh, if done, uh, very interesting. 
However, um, still can be made by humans. So now we use a safety critical software, a medical instrument or EDAS or something like this. Functional size increases quite a bit. Test intensity should increase as well because it, it's the software can start to be uh, uh, to harm uh, people. And total test size uh, is then uh, significantly higher. And if you look after complex software and intense system like a plane or a train or an autonomous car or something like this, yes, this is it that they will actually coming out with uh, so many tests. It is not possible to write test cases by humans that cover such a system. We need automation, not only for executing tests, no, for generating test cases. Otherwise, we do it like we actually do it. I mean, we just try to, uh, to fly with the plane and then we are wondering why it crashes and the trains take years for commissioning. Uh, autonomous cars, as you can see, uh, we wait for them now already 10 years and, uh, uh, well, we're you're still waiting. Uh, here you see uh, what the reason is why we use this model-based testing. I wrote a model for autonomous driving of a vehicle with only 37 data movements. We don't have to test all the code. We know that there is a lot of functionality in this coding, but at the moment when we want to know whether it's able to do autonomous driving, probably we can start with so only these 37 data movements and assess the layer, how it works. For instance, um, here we uh, have a functionality, um, well, uh, that uh, is uh, only a very, very uh, small point out of the total uh, that we uh, currently have. So that makes autonomous testing feasible. But how can we actually go ahead and uh, making sure that we really test something relevant? For this, I want to show you uh, a little bit more about combinatory logic. Uh, combinatory logic has a wonderful model, and the model is very near to test data, test cases. Um, it is important here to note that actually the model is uh, uh, well. It's a formal model. You have uh, you have test data, which formally yield a test result. In between, in, in behind of it, you have the uh, data movement map who actually can execute such uh, a model. Um, the, this, I'll call that arrow terms, uh, but you don't need to remember that. Uh, the, this constitute the combinatory algebra, which actually uh, has wonderful theoretical uh, properties. These theoretical properties are uttermost important uh, if we want to use them uh, for specific tasks um, uh, because we can use them to enlarge the test coverage. Um, yes, test data refer to the specific data groups. Actually, this is referring to the uh, cosmic uh, way of uh, describing functionality. We have these data groups that are moved around for uh, uh, in, the, in our software models. And uh, important is also the notion of test stories, because the test stories actually are the connect collections of test cases that have a coherent scope, a business meaning. And we will see test stories is actually what uh, we need to develop as we develop user stories uh, in parallel with uh, uh, when we do 
that will say an agile in an agile manner and a product, a new product, the cyber physical product. So these test stories are important. So why is this uh, combinatorial logic so useful for uh, for us? Because combinatorial logic actually allows to combine test cases. It looks very really simple. You combine a test case with another one if you have enough uh, uh, tests available that uh, produce the results that are actually needed in the second test case, you know, redefine the, in the right-hand test cases. This looks uh, like something uh, logical, but for uh, programmers, it simply means actually you can build up a full test by combining even, say, the, the initial unit tests. And then you have exactly what Nikolai have spoken about, a full test stack, which, which actually has no uh, uh, demilitarized zone in between and no vacuum between developers and test engineers, because actually uh, the test engineers use the stuff prepared by the developers in their unit tests to combine. You can combine as long as you want. You have, you have an explosion. You have an uh, infinite number of possible tests um, by vari uh, variations of test data, test results <coughs> on various levels. So what should that help? So you have here your test cases. This is the fountain, a photo from the fountain of the Opera House of Kiev, I think. Um, you can now generate as many test cases as you want with coherent test scenarios, variations of test da uh, data, by combining test cases from various devices, for instance, or it's a unit test from uh, from various uh, components in a system of systems, uh, like in an autonomous car, you can combine test cases from the weather forecast, from the uh, uh, from the sensors looking at the street composure, or from the uh, from the traffic uh, service navigation service, which tells you about uh, uh, traffic jams and uh, where to go, uh, recommendations where to go, for instance. So you can combine every test with any other test by combinatorial algebra. And you have a traceability. But what you should do with, uh, with those many tests? Uh, <laughs> the water is flowing and uh, uh, what should that help? For this, you need now something which I, I explained in the beginning is actually originating from marketing from uh, uh, from user behavior from the values of the user uh, there are many uh, uh, ways of explaining it but basically it means we need something that describes what's important for the user for instance a user of a car he wants to arrive in a predictable time frame that is he doesn't want to have any accident. He doesn't want to have any incident. He doesn't want to get stuck in a traffic jam. He wants to arrive when he actually can arrive under normal or under uh, uh, the current uh, situation. It naturally depends whether it's snowing or whether it's uh, uh, heavy traffic. Uh, it will not be always the same time, but it must be predictable. That's, for instance, a value that a car user has. But there's so many other values as well, actually. He also wants to, to use a car which uh, looks good and which is comfortable and uh, uh, make the neighbors uh, in him a little bit. Well, um, effective, he has his goal profile for user values which includes needs for privacy, security, emotional, business needs, and uh, the car, 
the system which is uh, uh, providing that values should be capable of providing exactly those values. So the user stories actually do provide those uh, product characteristics such that these values are fulfilled. For this, we have Six Sigma transfer functions. Transfer functions are, in our case, always linear, and you can do that by linear algebra. Now comes mathematics into a play that is, you have a means of calculate effectivity for user stories in terms of those user values. Naturally, you first must know the user values. It's not enough just to believe on some user values, but if you know them, you can really adapt the user stories that you are going to implement to these user values. And this makes your product attractive. It's always made your product adapted, but not always it has been uh, used so uh, consciously. And the, uh, the same technique is used for uh, looking after the test coverage. But now you look after the test stories, those collection of test cases that test your user stories. This should also cover your user stories. The user stories should be covered by the tests you are providing. So this means you have a means to even automatically select the right test cases from this fountain of uh, uh, test cases that we have uh, seen in our beautiful fountain. And this is, by the way, this is called quality function deployment. Quality function employment has been uh, invented in Japan 40 years ago or even 50 years ago and uh, adopted uh, today for many uh, things, including doing product development in a modern way and agile. This too is an ISO standard. It's the 16355 ISO standard. And now, naturally, the point is I'll... I'll I'll speaking about two ISO standards, you probably have never heard about them, uh, bringing them together. And I must, uh, I must uh, uh, admit that possibly not, a, not many people actually see how those two ISO standards cooperate. But together, their power is enormous and impressive. So it is worth looking after it. So I'll show you here, for instance, uh, six user stories, which still uh, belong to, uh, in some way to this uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicle uh, program with the 37 uh, function points that I've shown you before. And uh, this actually, these user stories cover a number of uh, data movements. So, uh, so every of this, uh, uh, these user stories actually uses a certain number of data movements and because uh, a data movement can serve more than just one user stories, you have more than the uh, 37 uh, uh, total uh, data movements. Uh, you, you, you can have multiple usages of same data movements for different user stories. This is normal to be expected. So if you now compare this profile which you got by uh, these uh, data movements, um, then you get something like a priority. Priorities are well known by the development teams uh, that use Agile. Uh, usually they have to uh, select uh, uh, the user stories for their priorities. How do now the priorities relate to tests? Well, you very simply use the total number of data movements in the test cases that relate to the user stories. So this is actually why measuring test size, measuring functional size is so important because it allows you to, uh, to speak something really interesting about test coverage. 
it means that you actually test what the customer expects, what has value for him. You do it uh, uh, via the, the, the two transfer functions that I've shown you before, but actually you have something that um, uh, that can even be used for automation. You can use it for automation. Actually, the, the nice uh, little girl here is uh, not yet uh, doing it for automation. It simply falls in love with uh, doing test stories right in the sense of, uh, uh, in, with respect to the value for the user. There is a little bit of mathematics, namely, we have seen here the convergence gap. The convergence gap is nothing else than actually uh, the uh, how well these tests actually fulfill the user needs. This is uh, can be calculated mathematically by uh, using a little bit matrix calculation and uh, uh, help you to de uh, determine whether your test stories actually match user needs. Um, nothing so difficult, but very, very, very helpful if you're really uh, interested in uh, testing the right things. The conversion gap is then uh, just showing whether those newly generated test cases are relevant for the user. And that means you can use the conversion gap for determining which of those many test cases that you can generate are actually useful. So let me just summarize that a very little bit. You have, first of all, you have uh, the ability to combine tests as freely as you want. You second have something that helps you selecting those that are important. What's that? We call that today artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is wonderful, but you can you can be intelligent without artif being artificial. You can do that manually. And even manually, it helps you uh, already a lot when you actually uh, want to test anything that you want to have as a product for people. So this is actually the most important thing that I want to relate. Um, now uh, a little bit of goody for the technical people who probably uh, I'm a little bit uh, overwhelming with uh, uh, curls and values. Um, to implement that, it is uh, not too difficult, actually. Uh, we have seen by Nikolai how you do it. And uh, my uh, understanding of Zapotec is Zapotec is absolutely capable of doing such things. Uh, the important point, naturally, is you need to uh, to have test steps for all your uh, appliances that you are actually uh, going on the test. You can't test the hardware in the loop. Uh, autonomously in the garage, you must have digital twins. And how do you do that? Well, Kubernetes. Use Kubernetes custom resources such that you can actually add the test cases to your product. This uh, means you uh, you simply have in the same environment you have also your uh, your testing environment which uh, or your, your test cases which you can run anywhere anytime unattended. Um, in real time it is also needed because uh, uh, you you have a limited amount of time at this position and the car for instance is not a supercomputer in the with uh, unlimited uh, resources, but the car actually connects to the cloud and you can use the cloud resources to allocate the necessary uh, uh, power for doing all the necessary or all the, uh, the calculations, but still based on the 
uh, software that's actually running on the car after all these updates and all the connections with the smartphones. So solution idea, you track sensors and cameras, track responses of actuators, build individual history per system. That were 12 for autonomous car, Internet of Things, airplanes, trains, that's whatever you have. And you get every component. Uh, uh, you, you have a digital twin that's actually need, where, where it is actually needed. And then you play a virtual orchestra. Sounds simple. In fact, yes, from the approach, it's simple. From the realization, it's naturally impressive but you shouldn't forget I me mean, if you uh, if you're for instance trying to build a train set then uh, it can easily be that you uh, need uh, nowadays seven years to commission that train these seven years are not for free so you can actually spend a little bit of money if you really want and it would still uh, help uh, producers of those uh, cyber physical products to save money um technically speaking you uh, as i said already use custom resources in kubernetes you use sidecar container in istio uh, to uh, do all the necessary metrics which actually because you want to uh, uh, to measure and to uh, uh, to measure what you really use, therefore, uh, best is you measure in the moment when you actually execute those tests. Um, well, um, definitely don't want to go into much detail with uh, these custom resources. Um, I'm sure that, um, yeah, I think. We had a lot of people here who can do it much better than I can. So let me come to the end of my presentation. Great confidence. Um, the compliance is something that is very valuable for customers. It is important it helps them a lot um you need to charge the customer for such value if you want to provide him and this is why we use those metrics we have times that are changing Compliance has become paramount for medical instruments. Uh, we have now in the EU a new uh, directive on it. Uh, it is uh, not yet well known how it actually should ever help autonomous vehicles to hit the road. Um, for artificial intelligence, we have uh, a little bit more in information what we should actually do it is model based but we uh, we are not yet sure what uh, compliance should be when artificial intelligence actually learns new behavior we have the internet of things which is uh, actually uh, say the first uh, instance where you have to start with uh, when you are doing autonomous real time testing uh, but all sort of the future cyber physical systems and we are only at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution all sorts of future uh, cyber physical systems will have that compliance issue so we address that by testing becomes integral part of product development as is test stories will must become equally important as user stories whenever you start writing down user stories you need the test stories uh, that relate to these user stories you need to uh, to keep the uh, test coverage matrix growing and you can from the beginning you can uh, actually start uh, uh, filling the matrix by uh, the test cases which uh, you are actually using for uh, measuring those user stories um, 
And that means, yes, Agile was yesterday. Uh, DevOps is uh, here since 10 years, but the fourth industrial revolution will actually need to adapt DevOps and Agile in order to uh, include compliance and autonomous real-time testing is probably the important step towards testing compliance autonomously in our cyber physical products so functional testing is from the beginning well uh, I, I i've said that already we start from the beginning with the test coverage matrix we uh, need that uh, to do uh, in all phases of uh, the devops uh, cycle um, in that sense, AR is not a tool, but it is really an approach that combines automated testing with combinatory logic and user-centric product development. Uh, well, and I say, today we have all those means and tools uh, at this position that we uh, need to, uh, to implement art and to do it right from the beginning. Uh, the only thing is, uh, we have to start with. Um, I wrote a book about autonomous real-time testing because I know this is something that is not easily coverable in uh, 40 minutes. Um, uh, also a book about these transfer functions which are so instrumental for uh, doing part right. And this, this was my talk. Oops. Thank you very much. And I'm ready for. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Stop sharing. Yes. <laughs> so we do have a question uh, from Mark that came into the chat. Um, and he said the functional explanation might also be found in modern techniques for chaos testing and production. Um, so I think he wants your thoughts around that idea. Um. Uh, well, Mark, I'm not sure uh, about chaos testing. I, I have actually never seen chaos testing in life in in real uh, uh, say in real execution, but you're. You're certainly right to say, yes, functional explanation can be found in uh, chaos testing, but um, not sure whether this chaos testing actually uh, is then really doing uh, testing in the right direction. That is, whether it can create the confidence level that we actually need for the cyber physical products. I think that's fair. Um, I have a quick question for you because you did talk a bit about kind of combinatorial practices. Do you prefer when you think about kind of applying those combinatorial techniques to testing, do you prefer to like do this by hand and use like a, um, an orthogonal array or are you like me and you go more tool driven? Um, to help you do some of that analysis and help you kind of create those test cases? Well, I'm not sure whether I understand it right. Um, uh, if you create these test cases, uh, the, the point is um, this is something where uh, humans are in charge and they have to do the work, but they can be helped by uh, well, algorithmic by machines, by mathematics. Um, I mean, basically uh, finding the right test stories to the right, uh, to match them with the user stories is a very, very difficult and creative task. Not something that can be automated. Not at all. The only thing that can be automated, and this is probably typical also, um, you, when you actually do the uh, this match, this test coverage matrix, you 
can evaluate whether you have a chance that your test stories actually will ever be able to uh, uh, to test the user stories thanks to the uh, valuation of user stories from the user values. So you can I check, but it does not it does not do that automatically. Oh, no, I absolutely agree. When we're thinking about coverage mapping and traceability, that's by hand. There are tools that will help you identify if you have a gap, but you're still going to have to put in the work on that. I 100% agree. I was more thinking about within those, within those test cases that we are um, aligning to our user stories within our traceability. Um, I come from a background of insurance. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> it wasn't uncommon for me to have massive sets of data that needed to be considered, multiple parameters that had to be aligned. So I would use combinatorial tools to help me kind of create the orthogonal array of all of those data sets as opposed to doing it by hand. Yeah. Because I'm going to be honest, I hate doing it by hand. I have, I know how to do it, but like if I can use a tool, I always will. And I was curious what your thoughts were on that. Is it is it actually better to put in the work and do it by hand, or is it, or do you agree that like a tool just makes it simpler? Well, I'm uh, as I said already. I'm a mathematician, and mathematicians are uh, very very lazy people. <laughs> it is. Um, we prefer it so much to have machines doing the work for us. And then just understanding what the machine does. <laughs> Probably this makes the difference. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, with, with uh, 37 data movements, you can't actually uh, run an uh, autonomous vehicle. You have, and with six user stories, you, you never do a project. So those that I actually uh, work with, they have, well, 5,000 user stories, 1,000 user stories at least. But uh, if, you're, if you're looking after things like an autonomous car or something, you, you get, uh, even with the number of user stories, you, uh, you easily can get 5,000 to 10,000. And if you do that all by hand, you won't, you won't be able to do it. You must be able to categorize it uh, so uh, you probably need all, already the artificial intelligence just in order to find out what you are actually going to do, uh, it, or at least you need uh, these algorithms, uh, uh, big data algorithms, to find out uh, what is important and what is less important. And uh, uh, no, you want actually. I mean, you need your your. Uh, uh, your brain and the spirit and the creativity uh, to uh, to really find out what uh, could be the best solution, but uh, uh, let let the computers do the the hard work. I completely agree. I tell people all the time: we as humans can think and feel and rationalize and decision. Even AI can't do that. Let the machine do the repetitive stuff. Let our brains do all of the important stuff. <laughs> well, we are out of time, and I'm so, so grateful for your talk. This was fantastic. Um, Philip, by the way, said he agrees with you. He's a math person, and he also uses tools. Um, so I'm so, so grateful. That was fantastic. I can't wait to rewatch it because there's a lot in there, and I want to kind of like get a chance to pause and, and think through things and watch again. Um, but thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. And now, folks, we're going to do something a, a little unusual. Um, I am going to introduce myself. <laughs> and we're going to jump over to my talk. Um, so I will kind of give you a brief introduction to me um, in my deck, which I'm going to share right now. Um, Oh, it wants to, there we go. Okay. So we should be, there we go. Perfect. Um, so as I said earlier, I am Jenna Charlton. Um, we're going to talk about leveraging low and no code automation to uh, enable teams. 
Um, just so you know, I do have LinkedIn. I'm Jenna Charlton on LinkedIn. I am not great about using it. My preference is Twitter. Um, and I'm much more uh, responsive on Twitter unless I'm specifically expecting to get like some sort of uh, thing on LinkedIn or if it like sends me a push on my phone, then I'll respond. But if you have a question for me, if you want to get me, grab me on Twitter. I'm they wrestle test on Twitter. Um, so a little bit about me. I have been in testing for a little over a decade now. I've actually lost track. It's probably more like 11 or 12 years, but I'd have to go back and look and see when my official start date was in testing to tell you for sure. Um, I am now a product owner for a company called Functionize. And it's interesting because Functionize is an automation tool. We are um, using AI to do some automation. We're going to talk about all of that kind of stuff in a bit. Um, but it's interesting because moving over to the product side, specifically in the testing space, I get to bring what I know about te what testers need and value and what enhances testing and now build tools for testers. So for me, this is a dream job because as I've mentioned a couple of times, my heart is for new, new folks into the testing space. I love manual testing. I love, I love automation from a, it enhances what I do kind of perspective. So now I get to bring in all of that to what I do at Functionize. Um, and it's it's really cool and very neat. And I will always consider myself a tester no matter how long I'm in a product. Um, I do use they, them pronouns. Not a big deal, but you know, if you tweet at me, that's what I use. Um, I think you've probably already seen this. I'm a cat parent, but there are two of them. They show up sometimes. So if they barge in, that's just what cats do. Um, I love pro wrestling. I love punk rock. Um, and I am really into web accessibility. That's kind of my other thing in the technology space. Um, I care deeply about ensuring that computing in general and the web and applications are accessible to disabled users. And that's partly because that's really an expression of empathy. And that's partly because I'm ADHD. So I want to make sure that I'm included in the things that I build. Oh, and by the way, one day I said testing is my jam and it stuck. So that's a little sticker that if we were together in person, I would give you. And if you ever see me at a conference in person, let me know and I will be sure to give you a sticker. So there are some very specific challenges that we're seeing as teams either look to shift to move to including automation in their testing strategy, or teams that have automation in place, but are struggling with it. And these current challenges are things like time crunch. Uh, we find ourselves in a situation where it takes time to get this stuff working. Um, if you are going to do traditional automation where you are using a framework and building automated tests um, through a coding language tied into your application, it takes time to get that stood up. It takes time to build all of that. It takes time to maintain it. Same thing. If you're bringing in a tool from a vendor, it still takes time to do this. But here's the thing. Just because it takes time doesn't mean that we necessarily shouldn't do it. But we do have to acknowledge that's a challenge that teams are facing, that automation does take time. There's also the cost involved. And you may say, well, you know, there's free tools out there. And there are, but nothing's actually free. Let's just be honest about that. There is no such thing as free. Even if it's open source and you're not paying for it, there's still a cost involved in getting it stood up in your, for your application. There's a cost involved in maintaining it. There's a cost involved in learning it. Same thing, if you go out and buy a tool, there's a cost involved in buying it. There's time involved in getting everybody trained and learning how to use it and doing all of the kind of troubleshooting that you have to do as you integrate that tool into your practices. Then we also have this issue of skill gaps. There is no team that is fully ready to shift to automation if they don't have any automation in place. And let's be upfront, there are gaps in everyone's knowledge. There is no such thing as a 10X programmer. There is no such thing as a 10X tester. Don't mean to offend you if you consider yourself one, but we can't be experts at everything. It's just not possible. We all are going to have something that we don't know, something that we don't, that we need to learn, something that we're not good at. I've mentioned that like, I can code, but you really don't want me to. I'm not good at it. 
it takes me a long time and I don't particularly care for doing it. It's just not what my brain likes. My brain likes to do other things. So for me, if I was told that, hey, tomorrow we're going selenium, I might have a gap there that we have to overcome. So that's a big challenge. And there's all sorts of different skill gap challenges that we see in teams. And this really is what will prevent some organizations from shifting to using automation or will prevent organizations from maintaining the automation they have in place. And then finally, one of the biggest challenges, and this is specifically as folks are looking to bring in automation, is decision paralysis. There are so many choices at this point. There are dozens, more than dozens, probably hundreds at this point of tools that you can buy. There are dozens of open source tools that you can bring in. You can build your own framework. All of these options require a proof of concept, which is going to take time. It's going to cost money. You're going to have to learn how to use them. So all of these challenges play into this decision paralysis. And we can find ourselves in a situation where we just can't decide what the right answer is. So all of these are the big challenges we're facing right now. Now, when we think about these big challenges that teams are facing, and a lot of these, by the way, especially when you think about things like decision paralysis and cost, are things that are coming from the management level. Managers have to think about how much budget do I have? What can I reasonably ask for to be able to get this going? Um, so our potential solutions, when we think about kind of this decision paralysis, the cost, the time, the skill gaps, is to do nothing, just maintain in the status quo, potentially begin an automation project. Now, keep in mind, if I say begin an automation project because automation is software. If we are bringing in an automation framework, we are starting a software engineering project. So this is not just, well, tomorrow we're going to start using Selenium. No, tomorrow we are going to start the software engineering project of bringing in Selenium. And we are going to then need to maintain that software engineering project of using Selenium. Um, Paul, and I always <laughs> mispronounce his last name, but Paul Grafazzi um, talks about this in his talk, Extra Extra Automation Declared Software, where he's really upfront that we need to draw a distinction here. That software, that automation is a software development project and we need to treat it as such. And then finally, our last option is to use a low or no code solution. And there's still, you know, things that we need to consider when we think about one of these low or no code solutions. For the most part, these are tools that you need to buy. So there's a cost involved. There's still going to be a time and a time investment involved in getting them stood up. So we've got potential upsides for all of these. Doing nothing is comfortable. Change is hard. Um, I'm not going to say that taking the easy route is a good thing, but we do need to keep keep in mind, we need to look at the upside that doing nothing does mean that we stay comfortable. Not changing is easy. Um, when we think about starting an automation project, actually bringing in some sort of automation framework, building those tests ourselves, this is a long-term scalable solution. Um, potentially, it's going to upskill our team because we're going to have to provide some training, especially if we're talking about teams that are primarily manual. If we've got folks who have been doing technical manual testing for their entire careers, or we have teams that are primarily juniors or early career, we're going to have to train. And that may mean bringing in a boot camp to do some training. That may mean asking folks to study on their own. So we're going to upskill our team. That is a huge upside. And this is scalable. We own it. You know, we can maintain it. And then when we think about bringing in a low or no code solution, this again, long-term scalable solution, for the most part, they're scalable, um, and it's gonna upscale the team organically. Now you may say, well, if you're bringing in a low code or no code solution, what are, what are people gonna learn? They're not gonna upscale, but really they are, because a lot of these tools have some learning built in. They're gonna help you shift to doing some coding. Most of them have some API exploration tools in them. A lot of them require you to start doing some DevOps work and learn how to work in a tool chain. Um, you're going to learn some networking. So there are some, some skills that folks are going to gain from using one of these kinds of tools. Plus, this is new software for them. Every time you integrate new software into what you're doing, you're going to learn some new things. And then we've got our downsides. Well, doing nothing will probably lead to failure in the end. If we are doing all of our testing manually, 
if all of this is being done exclusively manually by people, we don't have space to grow because all of that regression is done manually. That's a ton of time that we're asking for that doesn't leave bandwidth in our team to do anything else. This means that we're missing all of the really important things like relationships between stories, like thinking about how the testing interacts with the new stories that are coming in. We're gonna miss opportunities to do things like be involved in pull requests and code reviews. We're gonna miss the opportunity to do training. So while doing nothing is comfortable, doing nothing also leads to the end of things and will probably in the long term lead to failure. Um, when we think about bringing in an automation project, this takes time, money, skills, and maintenance. Do we have the time? Do we have the expertise? Do we have the people to do that maintenance, to learn the skills? Do we have the budget to actually make this happen? And then when we think about the low and no code solutions, there are potentially technology limitations. There is no such thing as the perfect tool. Every single tool you consider, both open source and a low-code, no-code solution, or another tool owned by a vendor that's a more traditional automation solution, this is going to have a limitation, no matter what. And even if you build something in-house, you're going to have limitations. So that potential is there. This does cost money. In the end, if you're working with a team that's been primarily manual, it might actually be cheaper than starting an automation project and upskilling everybody to doing coding. But there isn't a way to tell that upfront. It's gonna depend on what your team looks like. There is no one size fits all. There is no one answer fits all. But it's important to keep this in mind. There's still cost here, no matter what the solution is. Um, and we have to consider that. And by the way, doing nothing, there's a cost associated with that too. And I'm not just talking about the cost of failure. I'm also talking about the cost of losing customers. I'm talking about the cost of rework because there is a cost to quality. That's a whole nother conversation. I could talk for 40 minutes just on the cost of quality. Um, but keep in mind that doing nothing isn't just eventually you're not going to be able to grow any further. It's also going to in the long term have a cost associated. Okay, so we've talked about the upsides and downsides. Now let's talk about why some organizations are going to go this direction. <clears throat> some of the reasons are things like speed to launch. You are really going to get ready to do this faster using a lower no-code solution. If we're talking about an organization that doesn't have the skills in place already to build an automation tool or to build their own automation framework. That being said, what I'm finding when I talk to some of our customers is that we have organizations that have really, really highly skilled software developers and tests that still choose to go with a solution like ours. And they do that because they're able to now have somebody in, on the business side create their tests. They can integrate BDD kind of behaviors and get this moving really quickly. So there is a speed to launch here that's really helpful. Now, my experience may not match with other tools. I've only been with the organization for, I think it's two months now. So I'm still getting the lay of the land on what other organizations are seeing. But this is what I'm seeing in my day to day. Um, so there's a speed to launch here. And we're seeing it both with traditional SDETs and with teams that are primarily manual because there's some benefits there. Um, in many cases, these tools wind up being more affordable than going with a traditional software engineering project to build automation. Um, the reason it's more affordable is that people are expensive. This is not me saying that we shouldn't have automation engineers, by the way. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that if you are kind of at a cap on headcount, you can't bring in the people you need to get this off the ground, it will cost you less to go with a solution like this. And by the way, you may choose to do both. You may choose to bring Selenium in and bring in a tool like this. This is also going to help you bridge the gap. If we have a knowledge gap, if we have a skill gap on our team, our folks are primarily SMEs. They are experts in our software. They are experts in our business. They're experts in our industry. They're not experts in coding. They're not experts in automation. They may not be testing experts. They may be experts on the business side. We've got this gap here. 
a lower no code solution can help bridge that. It can be kind of the break down the barrier that we have between the developers and the folks who are doing the testing. Now, my hope is if you have folks who are primarily business experts, they don't have that testing expertise, we can teach people all of that great testing expertise. And I say that as an example of that. I came from the business side when I first got into testing. I learned testing on the job and I learned it through doing it and I learned it through training and I learned it through taking part in conferences. So we can bridge that gap, but this is kind of that those early planks between the two sides so that we can start bridging it and give people time to do that organic upskilling. And then finally, you're, you're gaining expertise. When you bring in a tool like this, you are bringing in a bunch of experts who have done this before. They know how it works. They can help you get started. And in many cases, they're really going to kind of jumpstart you and help you make that transition. So you don't have to do it on your own like you would if you do traditional a traditional automation project. So I wanna talk a little bit about how all of this low code, no code stuff started. I hope that there's some people who remember Selenium record and playback. Um, I will be honest, we were past really doing this when I joined testing. And I'll be honest, I didn't even realize that tools existed until my second job. My first job, it was exclusively manual. I was kind of held to running test cases and doing some exploring. I didn't really know what was happening outside of this very narrow scope that I was in. When I got to my second job, I heard that there was this happening. Um, I think we had really moved past it, but my second job, they were a little less technical. So there were still some folks doing this for their own testing um, within the organization. So we know that there were some things with this early record and playback stuff, right? Um, the tests were flaky. Anytime your UI changed, you have to you had to re-record the test. Um, it took a long time to do this. It was really easy to accidentally break your tests. Um, this was not a great solution. But it was an option, and it was really where all of the tools that I'm going to talk about came from. They were all inspired by this. They all took things from this. So this is how it started, and this is how it's going. So this is an inexhaustive list of some of the options that are out there to do some amount of low code, no code. Some of these tools have more advanced features. Some of them don't use record and playback, but almost all of them do. Um, and there's more than this. This was just what I could fit on the slide and have it not look like a mess. But there are definitely more out there. Um, and what I've done is I've taken this giant list of tools and I've kind of broken it down into three categories. So our three categories here are AI-driven, primarily selector-driven with potentially some AI, and then I have one thing down here in visual only. And I'm gonna start with that visual only. So visual only is Apple tools. By the way, I'm a big fan. I think they do really cool things. Um, Apple tools is an AI-driven tool, um, but it does only one thing, which is visual comparison. So if you remember to Svetlana's talk, where she talked about using AI to compare um, the visual on the front end, that's exactly what, what Apple Tools is doing. They're doing that kind of comparison using the exact same technology that Svetlana talked about. Um, and they do it very, very well. And this will work for you if all you need is that visual comparison or visual inspection. But for many organizations, we got to go deeper. Or there are organizations who have all of that automation, all of that traditional automation through framework already in place. They're using Selenium, they're using something else, maybe they're using Cypress, but they need that visual inspection to enhance. They may go Apple tools in their pipeline because they've got all of the other stuff already in place. Then we've got tools that are primarily selector driven. Um, SmartBear has a tool like this. I think they're using some amount of AI, same thing with MicroFocus, same, same thing with Tricentis and your tools called Tosca. Um, Eggplant is doing some of this. They were recently acquired and I've forgotten the name of who they, who they merged with, but they're doing some of this. Same thing with Sauce Labs. Sauce Labs does a lot of other stuff too. 
Um, and then there's LeapWork who is exclusively using selectors as opposed to having some amount of AI driven. So all of these are using probably something in the XPath or a JS selector or something like that to do some amount of record and playback based automation. Many organizations are choosing something like this because it's less brittle and less flaky and less fragile than the old school Selenium record and playback. They can have business analysts, product owners who are maybe not at a point where they can do something like use Cucumber. Um, they can have business users. They can have folks like that record tests and build those into the pipeline. I've talked to a couple of people over the period of the conference about how it's value that we're looking to deliver, not code coverage, not other things. And what matters is what the user or the customer values. These kinds of, of options that I, I mentioned here with the selector-based tools, the tests that they create are primarily based around what, what delivers value. Um, you can do end-to-end, -end, you can do things like that, um, but they are going to take a little bit more maintenance than the tools above them in the AI-driven. So in the AI-driven side, we've got tools like Functionize that I work for, tools like Testum, Test.ai, Mabel, TestRigger, there's more. Um, but these tools are using AI to do the selecting work. Um, so instead of having to identify the XPath, the, the JS selector, something like that, it's using AI to identify what an image is, what a link is, what a button is, where it is on the page. And there's some other things that we're going to get out of this too, things like self-healing that I'm going to expand on in just a minute. Um, there is no one answer. I've mentioned that a couple of times. There are lots of choices. And the one you go with is what really feel, fits best within what you're doing. One of the great things here though, regardless of whichever you choose, <clears throat> excuse me, is that every single one of these can fit into your pipeline. So it's no longer having to have um, a, a manual tester go in and click a button to run a bunch of tests. These are going to fit into your CI CD pipeline. You're going to run a build. Your other tools are going to run. Then you're going to go ahead and run this. Jenkins, for the most part, can kick this stuff off. But really, when you think about all of those tools that I showed you, with the exception of one of them, there is at least some amount of AI driving them. So the future really in these kinds of tools, in automation, in this perspective, is AI. This is where we're moving. But I have a big but <laughs> that goes along with the future is AI. And here's what it is. AI cannot replace all of the benefits you get from a tester like me. AI can't think, feel, rationalize, experience something like a user. What AI can do is identify whether something's on the page, identify whether it moved, identify the selectors, identify some other things, help you do some analysis. But you still need a person who can experience your application. You still need to know what it feels like for a user. So I'm really clear that we want to we want to move all of that testing that doesn't have a high impact, the testing that's regression oriented, the tests that are simply running the acceptance criteria into our automation tools, potentially into a tool that's AI driven. And we want to have those fantastic manual testers that are business experts, that understand usability, that understand accessibility, that know what our users value. We want to have them doing all of the important work. And there's one other thing I want to mention here, and I'm going to get off topic for just a second. I mentioned this yesterday. We had a conversation about empathy and tech and what we um, use things like facial recognition for. We talked about facial recognition. I mentioned a talk um, that was really impactful to me about the ethics of, of software development. The future is AI in this perspective, but there is a place for artificial intelligence. There's a place for machine learning. And in, in my perspective, this is where it is. I don't think that it should be our future in the way we analyze people in doing things like facial recognition. I don't think it should be the future in that perspective. It's the future in how we test things. It's maybe the future in how we do some amount of development. But for me, that's the end of where I, I think it should live. 
Um, so I just want to point that out because I don't want somebody to hear the future as AI and think, well, you know, Jenna said that this is the future because I think it's the future with a caveat. <laughs> All right, so back to what we were talking about. So what's the benefit of using a tool like this, using something that's primarily AI driven? Well, we've got the benefit of image comparison that I mentioned. What it, was it like before change? What is it like now? Do they still match? Um, we've got the benefit of self-healing. And self-healing is probably one of the biggest things that you're going to get out of this. So original record and playback, really flaky. Your UI changes. You got to re-record the test. Now we have AI and machine learning to go ahead and fix those tests for you. Within a certain tolerance, they're going to say, ooh, this changed. Okay, let me think about this change. Let me compare it to other changes. This is okay. This change that was made is okay. This is often something that we see if somebody changes the label on a button, which is common, by the way, if we're talking about things like e-commerce. You know, we've got sales for the holidays. We may change the label on the button from get coupon code to get today's best deal. It's the same button. We just changed the label. And it's okay. And it, there are ways that it's going to learn and it's going to accept a tolerance of error to say, oh yeah, same button, just new label today. Um, and then we're also going to reduce the time spent in doing things like test maintenance. And test maintenance is what's really critical. Um, I hope, actually, actually I hope I am, but I know I'm not the only person who has worked in an organization where every test goes red after a build and nobody pays attention. And you say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> all the tests failed. And they're like, yeah, but the build was successful. Like, well, the build wasn't really successful because all the tests failed. And they say, no, no, the tests always fail. We just ignore that. So all of a sudden, we've gone from having value in our automation. It delivers something to us. It tells us something. It's our canary in a coal mine. <clears throat> Pardon me. To, yeah, we just don't pay attention to that. And my next question is always, well, why don't you fix the tests? Well, we don't have time. Why don't we have time? Well, we've got all this other stuff to do. So all of that maintenance to the tests themselves gets ignored, gets pushed off, and then the tests stop delivering value. And here's the other thing. All of these tools are software. There is no such thing as perfect software. So there's also defects in our frameworks, in the tools that we use, and there's maintenance that's involved in that. Now, if we are buying a tool from a vendor, that maintenance isn't our problem. But if we are building something ourselves, if we are using open source, those defects are our problem and we're going to have to find solutions to them. But when we don't have time to do things like test maintenance, we don't wind up doing that solutioning. So these are some benefits that we get out of, out of an AI-based automation tool. Our teams are busy. Our automation teams are busy. Our manual teams are busy. That's one of the big reasons that we go to a tool like this. The things that our teams are doing, they're doing analysis of the stories, they're doing test design, they're identifying the right test to run, they're looking at traceability that I talked about a little bit here and there. Um, they're running tests, they're doing reporting, they're running regression tests, they're in sprint planning, they're planning tests, they're identifying where the coverage gaps are, and they're dealing with things like test debt. All of these other things, analysis, design, execution, reporting, regression, planning, all of this stuff is super visible. So these are all of the things that get the time. These are all of the things that our teams pay attention to. It's the test debt that we wind up ignoring. And by the way, that test maintenance stuff that I talked about, that's test debt. Just like we have technical debt of defects that are trailing along behind the sprint, they're building and building in the backlog, our test debt is basically the same, but this stuff doesn't have visibility. This stuff isn't what your product owner values. And I say that as a product owner, you know, this isn't something that they value. So we don't, we don't focus on it. We don't get it done. Test debt is what's ultimately going to drive us down. Test debt is what ultimately leads to a place where we're no longer delivering value. Um, test debt are things like not handling the defects in the framework that I mentioned. Things like lagging automation. We know we need to get these additional tests built. We know that these tests deliver value, but we're so busy doing other testing work 
especially when we talk about teams who are doing both manual and automation, that we can't get to keeping automation up to date with our development. Something I wanna point out about that is that I always joke that there's a snowball that we build in automation. And if you've never seen like a snowball roll downhill, I wanna try and make this really visible for you. When we're working with automation and we're building tests, no matter what we do, we're gonna be a touch behind automation or a touch behind development. There is a certain amount of, they have to build something for us to be able to identify how we're going to build a test for it. So we're always gonna be just a touch behind them. Automation is kind of like a snowball rolling downhill. If we are keeping pace with it, it won't get out of control. We can maintain it. But if that snowball is rolling downhill, and we stop, and we stop and we do something else, we're focused on, on a different thing, that snowball keeps going. It's not gonna stop. And it's getting bigger. It's picking up more snow, it's getting larger and larger and larger, and we're trying to catch it, but as it gets larger, it gets faster. And as we need to close that gap, we're never gonna be able to move as fast as it is. So we were here and we were okay, because we were keeping pace, but now we're trying, but that snowball is getting further and further down the hill and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're never going to be able to catch up. This is, by the way, why some organizations say, well, we're so behind in automation, we're going to bring in some contractors to get us caught up because that snowball got away from them. So lagging automation becomes test debt. Um, we've got other things like testability issues, not paying attention to version control in the tools that we use. This is really important at open source. Then we stop paying attention to traceability. That becomes test debt. And by the way, just like that snowball going down, rolling downhill in automation gets away from us, so does traceability. Once you stop focusing on traceability, you can't catch up with it because you have to figure out which stories go with which tests and you're too far away from them to remember. Um, we've got things like risk analysis not being maintained, not keeping up to date with it, and the big risk which is missing the relationships between stories. This is, in my opinion, the biggest issue that we see in test at. Those relationships between stories are the relationships between what we've already built and what's coming in. And those defects from what we already built and what's coming in, in my opinion, are the most critical. These are the ones that leave us in a situation where we have to refactor the whole application. These are the ones that leave us in a situation where we wind up on the cover of the New York Times because I'm going to use an example um, from, a, from a big bank. They had homeowners that were supposed to have been in a heart program and they got missed because there was a relationship between stories and they got foreclosed on because there was a gap there and nobody saw it. So people lost their homes because everybody missed this relationship between stories because they were too busy doing other things. I believe that automation and manual testing are partners. You'll never replace the humans. You'll never replace the humans that do manual testing. They're critical. We need automation. It's critical to enable the humans doing manual testing to do the important things like the relationships between stories, like identifying testability issues, like maintaining risk analysis and traceability. But when we let test that get out of hand, we don't get to all this stuff that's really important for the humans to do. Um, so that's really why these tools enable especially manual teams. That's why they're the quick start. That's why a lot of folks are going to them. Um, this is the first time I've given this talk. So I was really excited to take a lot of kind of new things that I've been learning and new ideas and stuff that I hadn't really spent a whole lot of time thinking about and put it together into something meaningful to kind of to kind of share it with everybody. Um, so I know it's a, it, it's a lot of concepts at one time, but I hope it gives you some new things to think about in regards to what tool do you choose, what tool works for you, why would we choose certain tools over others? And what should we really spend time focusing on and, and thinking about as far as adding value in our testing and in the way our teams work together? So that's all I got for you. I'm really, really grateful that you all stuck around and watched, uh, watched me give a talk today. 
Um, it's been fun hanging out with you and I'm going to be with you the rest of the day. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd love if you drop them in the chat. All right. Um, well, it doesn't look like there are questions coming in, but that's okay. If you wind up thinking of something, tweet it at me. Um, and we are going to go ahead and take our first big break of the day. Um, so it is 11, it's basically 11 o'clock. We are going to jump back in at 1120. So about 20 minutes from now, 23 minutes from now. Um, and we're going to talk with Anastasios and talk about an easy approach to continuous testing in DevOps, which I'm excited about because I'm excited to learn more about DevOps. So I will see you all in 23 minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, so I hope your break was good. You got a snack, got some caffeine. Um, I'm excited to welcome our next speaker, Anastasios, um, who is going to talk about an easy approach to continuous testing in DevOps. Very excited for this. There we go. There you are. Hi, welcome. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I can share my screen now. Yes, absolutely. Okay, can we see my presentation? Not yet. Okay. Let's see. It might, you might have to give permission to the browser. Um, click on it, when you click on it, does it open up? And, uh, it opens, but I still get the, the share button is, blank, is blanked out. Um, oh, okay, so after you click on it, um, there's going to be an option for entire screen and then window and then Chrome tab. You're going to want to click in where it is. There you go. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. It's my first experience with Restream. Um, okay, hello, everybody. Um, we're going to be talking for a little bit about an easy approach to continuous testing in DevOps. Um, easy approach is basically a, a relative term. We'll, we'll call this an easier way. Um, I won't be giving you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this because, you know, my reality is different from yours when it comes to our projects. But let's see how we can make this process easier. Um, and as usual, before I forget, let's talk about who I am. Uh, my name is Anastasios Daskalopoulos. It's pronounced like it's spelled. Um, I've been doing software testing and quality assurance since 2003. Um, things have changed a lot since then, and we'll talk about the changes that have been made and the changes that are continually going on. Um, I've been doing test automation since 2007. Again, test automation is a completely different world um, now than what it used to be back then. Um, when test automation was basically just getting started. And there were just a few number of tools basically dominated by um, just a few companies. But we'll, we'll talk about how things have changed in one way, but how the situations really stayed the same in quality assurance and testing. <coughs> and please get in touch with me um, either at the Gmail account or through LinkedIn. I'd love to talk about um, your experiences, what you have to go through, your challenges, and how it compares to what we're going to talk about, and how we can just work out some kind of way for everybody to, to move through this. Um, so we can talk about how we can basically develop better tests, better test automation in whatever framework we want. Okay, now so I would like to turn this presentation into a, into a conversation. Think of it as a conversation. So please ask whatever kind of questions you have. Let's talk about it. Um, let's talk about the changing face of quality assurance. Um, like I said, let's talk about an easier approach, if not necessarily an easy approach. Um, this approach can be used even if your organization is not actually a DevOps organization. Um, we'll talk about how things, what, what things like DevOps really mean, because it can be a very malleable term, as I'm sure if you talk to other people, um, other companies, 
other QA people, DevOps can basically have numerous, numerous definitions. Um, but the ultimate goal is to test thoroughly, you know, as soon as, soon as possible, as quickly as possible, um, after development, after deployment, um, and even during build, if your tests are that are that steady. But what we want to do mostly is to just test thoroughly, create many tests that concentrate on validation and verification. Um, two words that kind of go way back in the software testing world, but haven't changed um, their meaning, haven't changed their importance at all. But let's ask first. I think people kind of get away with get away from this idea when it comes to testing, really development, really anything in business is like, what are we trying to do? That should be the first question that we ask ourselves. What are we trying to do um, in testing um, at all levels of testing? We can ask, like, what is the point in test automation? That often varies from company to project even individual tester of like, what are you trying to do? What is the point of all this? Um, we need to ask something like Dr. Fellman stressed, you know, how fast is a test automation creation process? One thing that this approach tries to do is get people to create faster tests, not necessarily many tests all the time, but um, speed up the tests process, the test creation process, the test execution process, so we can really um, get down to, to finding issues and talk about the reliability of the system. Um, let's talk about budget. How much is this? Who creates the tests? Who should create the tests? Some companies insist that their developers are the best at creating the test because they're, they created the app, they created the feature, they worked on it, therefore they're the closest at it. Many people like me would say it's that closeness that actually removes them from that objectivity that's needed to really do good testing. And when do we test? When does the test, the QA process begin? Before, during, after development? When? Let's talk about all these things. Um, let's talk about how things changed. Again, you know, I'm not some kind of oracle about this. Um, I don't know for certain, but this is what I have observed. When I first started testing in 2003, there were basically 40 people in one big room that all basically did the same thing and did certain facets of the same thing. Um, and back then, QA was really at the bottom, many regarded at the bottom of the software development hierarchy. Um, basically, the developers were, you know, like the talented people, and us testers were kind of just doing um, work that was kind of beneath development. Um, but that's changed now, you know, in my experience. And there have been changes in specialization, um, testers versus developers. If versus is too strong of a word, let's use something else. Um, but I honestly think testers and QA should now have developing skills. Um, it's a world now where in order to really advance, you have to show that you can do some developing. Um, the language aside, um, you should be able to develop and at least know how developing works. And you should be able to um, write your own simple apps, your own simple features um, to get you really good at knowing what developers have to go through. Same thing with the developers. Developers should be able to write good tests and not just pass their features. That is one criticism that I have had about developers writing test automation because they basically just want to make sure that their features pass, that their tests pass. Um, but testing isn't all about passing. Testing is about finding issues and really being honest about the software reliability. And there are different roles now. Back when I started this role, the software developer in test, the software engineer in test, um, depends on the company's definition. Um, it's a good role that I think we should all grow into. We should all take advantage of. Um, but what is it? Is it a developer who tests or a tester who develops? Um, I think we heard correctly that 
software, like software testing, test automation is a software development project. And we should approach it as that. Um, in my opinion, this should be a tester role because it's a great opportunity to show our coding skills as well as use our test writing skills. So we can combine that, we can take great advantage of that. And as I've said, in companies that I've worked at, that I've observed, um, I think quality assurance has gotten a higher level of respect. It's gotten a higher status because of DevOps. In DevOps projects, now builds won't fail unless there are tests run and the, the build will not fail unless tests pass. So we, in the quality assurance part, we saw how Dr. Fellman split up the illustration of DevOps, the, the infinity symbol where we analyze. Um, we do have that higher level status because we can show that we need good tests. There have to be tests and they have to pass. And in some companies where the developers write tests, there is like a quality assurance position, sometimes called a quality engineer, who can actually who actually reviews the developer's tests and basically orders them to write better tests or show how to write better tests. Um, so the status has raised, um, but it depends on what we do. And again, this is what, what I've I've observed experienced. There's greater communication now between developers and testers. Back when I started, I actually started testing um, in, a, in, a, in a town outside of Helsinki, Finland at Nokia. And we were testing, we were running our tests in, outside of Helsinki, Finland, but the developers were actually in San Diego. So this wasn't just a case of over the wall testing, this was over the ocean testing. And you know, never did we actually speak to the developers. Never saw them. That we ran our tests. We, you know, their tests were sent. You know, our test results were sent to them. Our bugs were sent to them in San Diego. And there are also faster and narrower times, development times between development and QA. Like I said, you know, the testing phases used to be many weeks, if not months, long. This was just months, just for testing. And this was for, for testing like phone devices and the in the software for mobile phones. And same thing with development. We sometimes would wait weeks for a build that was testable. So things have gotten a lot faster. And I don't think there are very many companies that actually have that approach these days. And they have a different approach, what we call agile. There's a greater reliance on agile. Back when, of course, when I was that at, at Nokia, there was a literally a Nokia waterfall technique with different milestones and different different activities during each milestone. Now we're in a, an agile world, but here's the interesting thing that I've noticed about ne numerous companies who practice agile. Um, teams develop however they want and call it agile. Um, people basically do, teams do whatever they want, whatever they want, however they want, and it's all, it's all agile. And my, my question is, you know, is agile such a flexible term? And I urge everyone to look at the agile manifesto, the principles of the agile, agile manifesto, and just read about what the Agile Manifesto is supposed to be by the people who set up the whole idea to begin with. Like I said, it's a sequence of principles, like I think just 12 principles that we should all be familiar with. Um, other changes, quality assurance like testers. I'm gonna use this term interchangeably, quality assurance, um, software testing, QA people, testers. I'm gonna use that interchangeably in this presentation. As we say, you know, although it's not numerous as in years past, I'd love to know if there is really a company out there that does have a room full of 40 or 50 manual testers. Um, but there, it seems like testing is not as numerous just in terms of numbers as it used to be. But it seems like we have a higher status than ever and an involvement with development. 
and with not just development, but with, with the systems engineers, with the project management, with the client. Because I've been lucky to be in companies where I do talk to the client to find out client needs. In the past, I had no business talking to the client. And now, like I said, because of DevOps, QA is no longer at the whim of project managers um, because of DevOps policies, DevOps wide policies. But we can ask, let's ask ourselves, you know, what is DevOps? Let's see if we can get a definition for this and to see how DevOps changes in different organizations. Um, but to try and break down the whole idea of DevOps, um, this is basically the simplest, easiest definition that I found. It's development proceeds in defined stages, but there's a breakdown um, in previously siloed activities. And these stages, depending on the definition, you know, who wrote the DevOps books that your company is using, um, we can divide DevOps into these six areas, these six stages, planning, development, build, testing, deployment, and monitoring. You can call it operations slash system slash monitoring. And it looks something like this. We saw something very similar to this, like I said, with Dr. Fellman's presentation. Um, the arrows might be going in different direction, but it's all, we can see that it's a continuum. We don't have the waterfall-ish, you know, milestones. Everything's constantly being developed and tested and released and monitored. And we keep building on that. And like Dr. Feldman said, we have to keep testing. Testing should be continuous. That's why we have at the very bottom test, where it says test on one side and at the very bottom on the other side in the off side, it says monitor. That's what we do. We monitor when we test and everything's building on that same continuum. This is the simplest way, the easiest way. Probably everyone will agree that, that this is the case. Um, some of these, these terms, some of these stages might be different, but basically we have this continuum of continuous integration, continuous development, continuous testing, continuous monitoring, and everything repeats infinitely. But despite all that, despite all these, all these changes, um, I've seen the purpose of QA has always been the same. Um, what we do is we eliminate or at least grace, greatly reduce the number of bugs in the production environment, or before we get to the production environment. We can also use that term bugs. You know, in, a, in one company I work with, we, were, we literally weren't even allowed to use the word bug. You know, we always found issues. Um, but let's say we reduce the number of issues. The, the, we, re, we reduce the number of things that lessen end user confidence in the system. What else do we do? We account for the risks that may be present in the release software. We all we should know <clears throat> when something's released. You know what can be the problem. What risks should be should we be ready for? Adam talked about that yesterday. Um, and we also have to be in charge and organize our test creation and execution. I honestly think this needs to be the case. QA needs to be in charge of quality assurance. There can be. Um, you know, business owners, of course, who have the final say if something looks good or not. But we need to be in charge of the actual testing, the actual quality assurance processes. To avoid what I what I've I've gone to I've come to call the yes, this looks good testing philosophy. We can see that we've come into software testing through different fields. Um, some through insurance and data collection. Um, I've come in, I've come into software testing basically through airplanes. And so there is a lot of quality assurance as we should hope there will be in, in airplanes and aviation. And when there is, when, when, when the, the ground crew is doing the checks, there's a list, a definite list of what to check and what the results are. 
And you should probably be very happy that the ground crews on your airlines don't just look at any part of the system, like the ailerons, and just kind of look at it for a few minutes, go, yeah, this looks good. No, we definitely write out what we're, tech, what we're checking, what we're looking at, and what the results are. And we communicate those results. Um, everybody has to know um, what the issues are, if there are any bugs, where are the bugs. We all have to know, the entire project has to know um, what the system quality is. And yes, we should be the bearer of bad news when necessary. In my experience at companies that I've worked at, you know, project manager is often asked, like with the test results, um, was the testing was the testing process positive? Did we have good test results? My answer was always yes, we have good test results because we found a lot of bugs. And that's often been the, the opposite of what the project manager or the development managers want to hear. So to us, bugs, finding bugs is good. You know, that's what we want. That's what everybody should want. Um, we can call that bad news, or to me, that that's always been good news. We'll talk about this in terms of um, test automation. Um, very quickly, um, Get rid of the objections to quality assurance because I think you know our approach will kind of get rid of these objections. Um, QA takes too long. QA becomes the bottleneck. Um, to me, like long development is the bottleneck, and QA isn't the development. We we can't be the bottleneck. Um, budget. Many project managers just say, "Oh, we just don't have the money for it." Um, uh, the other developers have told me um, bugs escape anyway, so why even bother with it? I've actually heard this. And other developers just have the objection that they just don't want to do it. That, that's, that's the only way I can describe it. They just don't think it's necessary because they have the philosophy, um, if, if end users complain or find a problem, we'll fix it. Um, We'll get to that. We'll get to that rebuttal. But um, going from the top, from the last slide, you know, with with continuous integration and testing, QA is done in parallel to development. There's always something done to be with testing. We've heard this in the past two presentations. We can always be testing. Testing can start at the very beginning, at the at the very beginning of the at the very initial documentation stage. Um, budget because of this, you know. There doesn't have to be like always like a big separate QA budget. Um, fixing bugs in the early stages of documentation, development, testing, all those areas is cheaper than the expensive 30-day post-release bug fix period. Now we've always we've all seen, I'm sure, uh, graphs similar to this. Um, the cost of fixing defects. Uh, look at the cost involved in design implementation testing and then look at maintenance you know it's much it's much more expensive and it just looks a lot worse for the company it's just bad for the company to just wait for post release to really fix to to have the bug fix time um why why do why do project managers do that i got i got a secret from that um from a project manager who says that qa rounds come from the project's budget but post-release fixes are charged to the company, which can be categorized as waste. So the mentality was, you know, as a project manager, it's, it's better for me for the for the company to lose money in waste than for me to go over budget in my own project. Um, but we can get rid of that mentality through this approach. Um, also, bugs escaping anyway. Um, we can look at risk-based testing to try and mitigate that. Um, what we really want to do is, yes, we can't find everything, but we can find the showstopper, serious, even medium severity issues that really need to be found and fixed. So they're the critical areas in the, in the feature can be used by the end users and by the business owners, by everybody with confidence. But it's inevitable that bugs are released, but you know, they should let's try to make them as minor severity as possible and quickly fixed. But we have to be careful about what they call defect immunity. Um, because allowing low levels, low severity defects 
makes possible the release of continually greater severity defects until catastrophe strikes. And the big example of this is with, with the space shuttle, because space shuttles were launched with what were deemed low severity defects that just weren't worth fixing because that would put the launch schedule behind. Um, but the problem with that is if you allow little bugs through, you allow more and more little bugs and they grade, they, they actually get bigger in severity until the big catastrophe strikes. So everything is worth fixing. All issues are worth finding and fixing. And very quickly, other objections that I just don't want to do it. Like I have had software developers who find bugs as like a personal affront. It's like, how dare you find bugs in my code? And the objection that I've recently dealt with is, you know, if end users complain, we'll fix it. Again, look at the costs. You know, we're, we're, we're costing, we're, you know, we're wasting company money in just knowing that, you know, yeah, if the users complain, we'll fix it. Um, and, you know, buggy software loses customers because, you know, the, the bug in the software, the bug in the website, the bug anywhere is a blow to the company's credibility. And like I said, just search for news about Cyberpunk 2077 to see the financial cost of buggy software. The company literally lost tens of millions of dollars in buggy software. So everything's worth fixing. And often we have to avoid the failing QA self-fulfilling processor because we don't have time for good testing. There's no documentation. There's no direction. There's no definition. Um, literally, you know, I've, I've been in projects, I've been in companies where I've had to test websites. I've been given two hours and I'm simply told, Find, 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 look for something that's broken. That, that's the only thing. Look for something that bro that's broken. You have two hours. Of course, that's not going to lead to good results in terms of QA and testing. And, you know, we're left with the fact that, well, bugs got out anyway. So let's make, um, this is often what happens when development is in charge of testing. You know, let, let's put ourselves in charge of testing. Um, along with that QA, has to be independent and in charge of QA. Um, at least now, being a project where quality assurance is not just the last and least important task. We do have our own ways of thinking and our own processes. And also, um, we also have certification. It also surprises me how few people um, know that there actually is software testing certification. There is quality assurance certification. It often surprises a lot of developers and project managers. To them, you know, software testing certification is almost like being certified in vacuum cleaning or something. But we do have our own processes. We, we, um, we do have our certification, which is in our own standards and, and ways of working. Um, but let's find out where do we start. Um, we've seen in the previous two, and there were actually the previous three presentations, um, especially in the last one, that yes, test automation is very important. We'll be getting to that in a few slides. But where do we start? I've been in projects where people begin, QA people immediately begin automating. And that often, that often ends up basically just automating buggy software because we haven't really fixed, we haven't found and fixed the bugs. We haven't identified what the issues could be and what we should look for. So the ultimate goal is right off, like starting with the documentation phase, the ultimate goal is to quantify software reliability. How do we do that? By finding and fixing bugs. Um, and reporting stable areas through repeated tests, you know, with different input and expected outputs and using test automation can, can help us run tests with a lot of different kinds of inputs and they can um, match and, and assert the expected outputs. 
Um, well, let's start with a plan. We have to plan. We can't just test it. You know, we have to find out what we're doing. Um, many developers, and I've seen testers do this too, simply say they tested a system and it's fine, you know, without saying what they did exactly, what the results were. To quantify, we have to actually write down what we do. Um, so let's start with a plan. This doesn't have to be anything bigger, anything major. I hope the days of like the kind of test plan I had to write for Nokia.com, where basically I, the first step was I had to write like a 20 to 25 page test plan, which basically was, you know, spread around, um, was accepted, and then went into a doc lib and no one ever saw it again. The test plan should be a, a living document. People should be using it. Not just testers, but developers, project management should be familiar with it. You know, the business owners should know what we're doing too. And it's just a plan of, of what you're going to do and why you're doing it. And we shouldn't start testing or automating without any plan or purpose. I found this, if you search for just one page test plan, you might find a result like this. Um, this is for a release, you know, for a sprint. And all you have is just, just one page. What are we testing? What are we doing? What are the schedules? What are the risks? And how are we doing this? I think you can put that all into one page. Um, and also the old testing realities. This, this was a big thing if, if any of us, I hope a lot of us still have, have test certification. We always talked about verification and validation. Um, validation is, are we building the right system? You know, is this what the client wants? And yes, I have been in projects where basically what we have works, but it's not what the client really wanted. And also we verify, does the system work right? Um, we always test in terms of validation and verification. Is the client happy with this and does it work? Um, but starting off, the last thing we'll do about manual testing, if you, if, some people object to the term manual testing. I pr prefer to say exploratory testing because you can do this either before, like during the documentation stage. You can also use this exploratory testing charter, which it was just a piece of paper. It can even be just a notepad, just, just a dot text file where, what do we do? Um, it's just exploratory testing, but you plan it out. Um, you can just you can do these five five steps. What are you doing? Like, what is a specific feature area? What are you trying to do? Um, what are the specific the specific expected results? What do we want? Let's record the steps and let's find let's let everybody know what the results were. So we avoid the yeah this looks fine type of results reporting. So you can do this, like I said, before or during. You can use this to find information for your test automation. Um, one more thing, plan and document what you did with the charter. Publish your results like whatever you work with in the Slack, in a wiki, in Confluence. But understand the application. You know, this exploratory testing isn't necessarily for just finding bugs. It's for learning. It's for learning the application. Like I heard a long time ago, I think this applies. QA needs to know the system better than anyone. We can look for specific bugs, issues. I think a good tester, a good test manager, a good QA manager is good at finding bugs. Um, and also pay attention. That's probably the best advice. Um, keep in mind in attention blindness, the fresh eyes system works because often bugs escape because we see what we think we should be seeing. Um, but let's finally get to test automation. Um, I think DevOps, the DevOps approach, is all just about test automation. Um, it's about continuous testing, and it's just test automation. Think of it as faster and more thorough test automation. In other words, this isn't something else we need to learn. We're already doing this. But let's try and find ways to use our test automation faster. Um, like I said, continuous testing is about test automation. We don't have to learn anything different. Um, the thing I have to say, though, um, 
poor test automation won't give good results. Just like there's good test automation, there's bad test automation. Test automation by itself is not a panacea. Test automation won't solve anyone's problems. Um, like we heard already this morning, um, good exploratory testing and good test automation go together. Um, and that is absolutely true. We, we have to combine these things. You explore, you learn, you automate. It's all part of one continuum. Um, and like I said, too many projects simply just automate without any plan, purpose, or goal. Um, we have to find out our plan and what our purpose is in doing this. And we all ask these questions, what are we trying to do? Um, and use the above precepts that we saw for explore te exploratory testing in test automation. Um, let's organize our tests. Tests should um, be on about specific areas and let's label then title the test, tag them. So it should be obvious what the tests do. You shouldn't just throw a bunch of J unit, for example, at people and say, here's the test. And we also have to avoid just making like one big four, 500 line, all inclusive end-to-end -end test, which always ends up failing. Um, for our purposes, continuous testing is test automation. Um, poor test automation will not give good results. Like, you know, I have to, I have to agree in my experience, I've seen, I've been in too many projects where I've seen all red. Yes, that's me. I've seen um, test automation. Not that I've been doing, I want to make clear, but um, in competing subcontractors, they insist on doing the test automation process. Their, their regression tests are all red, and they just, like, like you said, they, they just ignore them. Um, we have to combine good exploratory testing with good test automation, and we can't just automate, like we say again. Um, so let's organize our tests. We'll be seeing how to do that. Um, and avoid tests that simply check off tasks. Um, in DevOps, we at, at the developers, at the tests that I've had to review, I've actually had to see tests that basically just said, yes, the status is 200. Um, I found this text and I found this button, the test passed. That's not testing. We actually have to test like people do. Um, test automation that gives poor testing won't give good results. Um, it's not test automation that gives good or bad results, but good testers. Um, and we can't blame test automation for buggy software. Going on with this, test automation is testing software in the same way a human tester would. Um, yes, people are the best testers, and we can create tests that test like a good software tester does. Um, I honestly believe this. I create my test this way. If a person can run the test case, then test automation can do it. But let's create good tests instead of just saying, let's let test automation do this. Um, the value of test automation is proportional to the skill and motivation of the test automation engineer. A good tester will find a lot of defects, a lot of bugs. Sometimes, you know, I shouldn't say defects because you know, I worked in companies that didn't allow that. The legal department didn't allow us to say defects. Um, a good tester will find bugs. A good test automation engineer will also find bugs. And uh, what's defined a skilled and motivated test automation engineer can find issues and generate reports better than someone who simply just has it as a task. Um, too many DevOps operations just have testing is just a task to just write off and that's it. Let's use that for actual testing. And as we saw earlier, I found the statistic, you know, anywhere from just 10 to 33%, anywhere from one tenth to one third of issues are found with test automation. That's the reality of test automation. Um, we're not gonna find a lot of our issues with just test automation. Um, Pick your favorite statistic, but the harsh reality is that test automation will not find a majority of your bugs. You have to have 
um, a lot of fresh eyes. We have to have good exploratory testing. You have to have good documentation. And we do that, you know, with having everybody involved in the project with bug, is, bug slash issue finding. Um, quality is about the whole project. It's not just about us. It's about That's the whole project. Um, so let's make sure you're finding bugs and not the end users. Um, um, so I'm so sorry, everybody, but we, in order to make sure that we we keep on schedule, because some of the some of our other speakers have to meet their schedule, um, we've got to move on to the next speaker. However, this was fantastic, and I highly recommend folks get in touch with um, Anastasios on LinkedIn to get more information and to ask questions since we didn't have time for Q&A. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully we'll connect again soon. Thank you. All right, folks, I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, I'm gonna bring on Ryan. Ryan is gonna talk about his time at Alaska Airlines and service virtualization and test data management and kind of the journey of doing that in his time at Alaska Airlines. Hi, Ryan. Good morning. So excited to have you. Thank you. Okay, let's see if that, uh, I'm sharing my screen. So I was wondering if it's, if it's an admin option from your side to make the presentation come up. There, there we, we go. go. Awesome, <laughs> great. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I don't know if anybody's seen some presentations I've done before, but uh, the topic is test data management and service virtualization. And our earlier versions were around why testers can't test. Well, this is now just more of like slowly dropping off some of the other pieces that uh, were very thorough and now building more into kind of where we are today. And so this is why I've kind of rebranded it and added to it and call it our journey. Let's see here, make sure the arrows work. So I'm gonna kind of high gloss over our journey real quick is, so I started Alaska Airlines in 2010 as a mobile test lead for our iOS, Android and mobile websites. So those also depended on our web services. And in order to help test these applications, we used Fiddler. This was great because this allowed us to essentially fiddle with the uh, API responses to force conditions that we couldn't do in the application that uh, were areas we didn't have control over. Well, this is really cool and allowed us to test a lot of cool things we weren't able to, but also Fiddler has another really neat advanced option called autoresponders. And what that allowed us to do is literally fabricate or record a uh, request response pair and set up a correlator Mind you, this is free. It only does it for HTTP. But this was a, essentially, I call our first step into virtualization. Flash forward a couple more years, uh, we had another SDET on our team who was like, well, this Fiddler thing isn't really working for me. I need to do uh, multiple responses uh, that change over time. And he used Wiremock. And so it worked in a different perspective. It used more of a cursor approach. So each request that would go, come in sequence would get a different response. Uh, back then, we didn't have all the capabilities uh, that are available now. What we ran into here was when you try to scale up and do parallel tests, they wouldn't get the right response. And so it was really hard to, we weren't getting consistent results. Today, those problems are now solved. Uh, there's, I think, called mock server that can solve that for you. If you're gonna got automation and uh, virtualization kind of solution. But in 2014 is really when you could talk about the hockey stick approach, like what really changed for us and to get new capabilities. And for us, this was uh, adopting Parasoft Virtualize uh, for a large project that I'm gonna go into detail here during the presentation. Um, what this kind of tooling does, not only does it do HTTP, but it allowed us to do other protocols, SOAP, REST, MQ, database, and it's like it is a like a full, I'll call it a big hammer solution, which can solve lots of different problems uh, very, very fast. Well, then our next step in 2017, after you know, working kind of through these little baby steps of evolving through our solutions, we started kind of building our own solutions. 
uh, using uh, lightweight web services and what we like to call engineered test data. Uh, engineered test data is um, just a quick glimpse. This is like my own personal branding is it's not recorded data. It's actually purely engineered. It is designed uh, from ground up and fully synthetic. And so this is uh, the tail end of this presentation is actually a lot of our efforts uh, in this space. So let's look at our uh, earlier showcase of some of our solutions so you can kind of see the baby steps of how we evolved. So Proxy Recorder, this is essentially that uh, Parasoft virtualized tool set out of the box allows you to set up uh, a proxy in between your client and your services. Uh, what's really cool about it, it gives us you uh, gives you a monitor so you can see the requests and responses in real time. So that gives you visibility and that actually saved us quite a bit of time because the old way we would actually have to go into another logging tool to see what happened. But now you could see it in real time. Another cool ability this gave us is um, scaling is bridging and cloning. We were running up to seven environments. And so we would actually have one feed um, recorded from one environment and we we're able to now record that and broadcast it to all these other environments. We kind of built on the solution. Uh, the tooling they used early on was essentially a Orient DB NoSQL database. And our guys, we were hyper efficient and super fluent in uh, T-SQL. So we actually adapted their tool to uh, use uh, a SQL backend instead. And mind you, this is not recommended or advised. It just happened to be, we're like, we don't have time to figure out something new. Let's just use what we know. And so we were super quick and putting that together. And that gave us these really neat, cool capabilities that actually helped us in these next steps. Now that's being recorded to a SQL database, we could use uh, XPath and XQuery to analyze the data and then start to do these really cool, I'll call it this baby step to get to engineer data by now transforming it. Okay, so we now have this kind of recording and playing back. Well, this next step is building on those transforms I was talking about. We were able to record uh, scenarios, but the training team came to us and said, we need, we need all these scenarios. We need to train a lot of people at once. And we want these bits and pieces out of the environment. So I'm gonna, just so you know, this is a future slide. I'm gonna show you actually the UI and what this solution really looked like. So we uh, ended up cloning, uh, creating some synthetic aircraft so we could handle parallelism, but then also using our uh, I'll call the engineer data approach for creating condensed uh, flight durations. And this gave us very extensive training opportunities, which I'm going to go into more here in a few minutes. Okay, we're building up on this capability. So our automation team is like, hey, I'm seeing you, you're doing this recording, you're giving us consistent data in this one environment. I now see you scaling that data to solve these other problems in the other environment. Can you give us the capability where you can just give me data on demand? If I give you a request saying I want this flight and I want it in this D minus state, uh, D minus is departure minus minutes from uh, when it's going to depart. And I want it in this specific environment. So since we had that recording, we actually took and built our own fake web service, built our own API specification and have it reach into our database of recorded data, apply those transforms, and route that data to whatever environment they specify. This gave us massive amounts of automation capabilities for getting consistent data. And uh, so our BUAT team could be building scenarios in one environment, and they're like, hey, we want you to run this regression on it. He could just retarget his framework saying, to go run these new scenarios against that environment, but then still be running them in our other environment. So this is just, I'd say bar none, one of the coolest things we've done. Uh, and this in detail could be its own presentation. Next is this passenger services. This is kind of a sidecar only because it's so big. Literally, this could also be its own presentation. Um, we're running an airline. We have customers going through the life cycle of booking and uh, checking in and boarding our aircraft that is all stored in a, a real uh, saber mainframe 
Sabre is a GDS, which is a global distribution system. So all the airlines can take and share uh, ticketing capabilities so you can book connecting flights. Well, there's a per hit cost on this. So what we ended up doing is um, building, virtualizing the Sabre, uh, virtual, sorry, Sabre service wrapper around that. And by doing that, we started off doing recording. So it's just now just kind of a lot of recording, but now we are doing the transforming and making what we want and not versus what we got. And so that's now kind of more of that transition to engineer data. Well, once we've now parsed this all to uh, SQL, our behind the scenes SQL database, we now have massive capabilities. Uh, cool things here for us as an airline is simulating all the passenger codes. There are like special business rules for uh, like for disabled seats or if there's a wheelchair or oxygen or pets in cabin or pets in a cargo hold or dangerous goods, where to store them on the aircraft. This allows us to test all of those cool scenarios that we need uh, for this uh, flight operations uh, weight and balance system. Also, these other neat capabilities we have, since it is essentially a table, we could do uh, adjacency and Cartesian and referential uh, seat mapping uh, to load up new rules. Mind you, this isn't rules in the system. This is rules in the test data. So uh, a good scenario here is an example is like Seattle to, um, uh, it was not Burbank, but um, John Wayne uh, Airport to go to Disneyland. Say we have an aircraft with 150 seats. Okay, so we have 150 seats, but that's going to be a lot of families with a lot of young children. That creates a lot of unique scenarios for weight and balance. And those scenarios are essentially we go through adult, children, and lap infants. Say if we had, you know, easily could have, you know, ten, five, ten families going down to go to Disneyland. But let's say several of those families have lap infants. You can easily have 10 lap infants on the aircraft, which now you would have 160 people in 150 seats. So this creates a lot of uh, nuance for testing our weight and balance system. And so this was, again, uh, could be its own presentation for all the detailed work we have here. Uh, one of the pieces I haven't really talked about is it also uses um, time event modeling. So it actually, as time goes on, the responses keep adjusting uh, based on essentially these uh, programmed curves we put in for what's the percentage of people loaded through the different states. So it actually looks like a real service when you uh, interact with it, but it always ends up on the final answer. It's it's really it's given us so many great capabilities for testing our systems. Our system, okay, this is it. This is the system we were. I'm talking about. It's in the middle, and this is the actual architecture diagram for it. It's been you know fuzzed out and condensed so it can fit on a screen. Uh, the system we're testing is in the middle. And all of those tendrils reaching out are all those interfaces. Those interfaces eventually reach out and go to, you know, a REST service or a SOAP service or a message queue or an application uh, or a third party vendor service or even our satellite communication system. So what I want to convey, this is not a trivial, hey, here's a single client with a service we're calling. This is a uh, complex orchestration of many services and many events. But let me give you the candy coated view to kind of talk through our uh, capabilities of how we kind of step through uh, solving these problems. I call these the pillars. Uh, our, I'm going to rattle them off here real quick, and then we're going to step through them as uh, environment isolation, uh, test data management, service virtualization, and event orchestration. So our first one is environment. We took and partitioned off our own environment called CERT, short for certification, and put all of our applications uh, in that environment. Next, we used a taste test, sorry, test data management tool, uh, just TDM, to solve all our database problems. How we solve those problems were actually taking and uh, some core features were actually subsetting so those are initial databases like might have, you know, three to six and nine months or a years of data, depending on the retention policies for those uh, particular applications. We just need one day. So our first step is subset to the one day we wanted to target. The other piece we use in here uh, 
is uh, obfuscation uh, PII data. So it actually strips and randomizes. So there's no PII data in our synthetic environment. The other cool piece of this that's very specific to us as an airline is date aging. So by combining those two key features of subsetting and date aging every day, our airline literally takes about five minutes to completely rebuild this environment to clean it up, age it forward and reload it across multiple databases. And one thing to add, these are multiple different database protocols. This is like Oracle, we've got SQL, and a couple others. So the, the tool is quite capable. The tool we used here was actually an IBM Optum, but we also use some of our own internal scripts as well to solve some of these problems. The next piece was the service virtualization. Uh, we talked about the passenger service already, uh, but it was also aircraft. So the aircraft and the captain are always uh, sending you know, messages back and forth to the ground station. A couple of the scenarios we have here is that it was very specific. We're not just solving IT technical problems, but these are also business process problems. Uh, so our pilots uh, have to work a, uh, they get sent a flight plan from the system and they analyze and they look at it and they, they run the numbers for fuel and weight and balance, uh, again, manually. That's essentially the double check. And so they have to respond to that. That's just not just an easy like request response problem. It's actually like three or four stages long, like initializing the aircraft, uh, getting the, the flight plan, submitting the load plan, and then him acknowledging it but then there's other synchronizing bits that are happening. So there's about you know four or five steps of back and forth that occur. Another piece that it does is once they've done that, he knows the amount of fuel it's going to take. And so it actually takes an auto response with uh, converting fuel slips to uh, fuel on board messages. So this is just all about breaking down all the little life cycles and analyzing those uh, events and or uh, rest, request response problems. Okay, our last piece here is flight event automation. This is essentially the living, breathing heartbeat of the airline. It's not just uh, those business processes done by uh, flight attendants and pilots and gate agents, but it's also the flights themselves. Uh, in the industry, we refer to these as UI, which is out, off, on, and in. Essentially, the aircraft leaving the gate, taking off the tarmac, then finally landing on its destination and pulling into the gate. So what we've done is this is a event model framework that does stuff in real time. All of these processes are time-based. Uh, and this fires those and keeps it all in that kind of like referential integrity across events across time. Okay, so we now have this cert environment. This is all nice and clean, things are flowing. Well, you think, but this is a best practice I'm gonna throw out there is when we did this was initially based off of recording. That recording might have had some regular operations contained in it, or maybe some of the scenarios we needed weren't there. So we actually had to spend a few weeks after we started this uh, first snapshot was to actually massage that data in place. I.e., we had to throw in some more freighters because we only had one. We need we need to be able to test more than just one freighter. Uh, also, is uh, to clean up the irregular operation scenarios that might have created some uh, weirdness because we don't want that every day. That's not normally how you run an airline, but we, we get to that here in a few minutes in our next area. So this is now all nice, pristine and clean and running. This is now that magical step of the evolution. We now take those uh, proxy recorders and put those on all those interfaces. We can now record a nice, clean data recording of our airline running. And this is the magical step. We can now disconnect from all of that other infrastructure, all those databases, web services, and servers, and there's so much infrastructure that takes place, you can now disconnect from it. So consider this IT cost avoidance. We can now just take this small data set and run this to another flight operations system in our in those other environments I was talking about. We used a, we started off doing cloning, as I mentioned earlier, but as those teams said they had different data needs, we just started using that uh, recorded data and massaging into the state they needed to satisfy their needs. Okay. This is the real system that I'm talking about. This is our flight operation system. 
down the left hand side, you'll see uh, aircraft numbers, uh, tail numbers, and there's a little number up inside of there called D40, D30, D35, or 55, and that's essentially the D minus to the next flight. Across the top is time and UTC, and all the blue bricks are essentially, uh, we call them pucks, but those are essentially our uh, Gantt view of looking at our airline. Well, imagine if you were a tester and you want to test this flight out here. This presents several challenges. Uh, first of which is you got to wait until later in the day to test that particular market. Well, what if you find a defect? Okay, this compounds the problem. You have to wait for the developer to retest. Then you have to wait to retest. Then what if somebody else has a test case against this? You can see that this now, even though we have this nice clean recording, you now have a, a different problem. Even though it's consistent, you still have a constraint of not enough test data. Well, told you about our little evolution of using that recorded data. We were able to uh, get feedback from the training team. And given the scenarios they want, we were able to load up using those base sets of messages and then applying our engineered data transforms to them provide an airline that can now go in parallel. So if you look across the left-hand side now, all those tail numbers are sequential. They're all in the same D minus state. All the flights follow a predictive pattern. And what this gave us is massive uh, testing and training capabilities. What you see here is a lot of flights. When we first loaded this up, we think we came up with about 4,800 uh, flights in all. Well, to give you perspective, uh, Delta, one of the biggest airlines, has six to 7,000 flights a day in production. We were essentially three quarters of the size of production in just our little test training environment. So that created some performance problems because we're not at that scale. So we had to call thresh or reduce the data a little bit. And so that's why you see this checkerboard pattern here. And so what this is, is or this is just when you have control of the data like this, and it's so engineered and so predictable, it's a lot easier to work with. We essentially could half the amount of data in the environment just by doing what we call a double div mod distribution. But it's really just saying, let's take the even number aircraft and disable the even number of flights and take the odd number of aircraft and disable their odd number of flights, which now reduces, you know, halves the amount of data in the environment, but it's still available enough for everybody to keep working. Alaska Airlines prides itself on being essentially a real time logistics company and running an on-time operation. The people on our front line have been tested, sorry, trained in this. Uh, when I test checked a year later, they said that 3,000 people had been trained using this environment. I checked back a few years later, it was 5,000. I don't know where it's at today, but it's probably in the seven, 8,000 uh, framework. And that allows us to essentially use these approaches, not just to solve uh, testing QA problems, but also to solve operational training uh, problems. Okay, so that's our old world. That's what we were kind of doing from uh, 2014 to 2017 window. But in 2017, we started adopting, um, taking these approaches and really dialing on the data uh, to do what we call engineer data. Again, it's using a lightweight web service with this prescribed data as its back end. Uh, we have some really cool capabilities around complete teardown. Uh, that actually build up the files, run them through the system, and uh, populate the databases in about one to two minutes. It's even faster than those other solutions we've built. Uh, what's great about that is we actually put the, that control of that data in our customers' hands, so they don't need to ask me to do anything. All they have to do is give me the scenario once, and then I put it in their hands, and they can toggle it and say, I want the environment to be like this. I want to do long haul flights. I want to do short haul flights. I want to do freighter flights. I want to do milk runs. They now have all these capabilities at their fingertips to uh, rotate the data in the environment. Uh, we still leverage a lot of SQL uh, store procedures because we're very SQL uh, strong and essentially analyzing and structuring our data. Therefore, we use SQL agents, but our newest evolutions are actually using Azure functions to do that work for us. This last bullet point I just want to talk about if people are on the call and understand what that is. Uh, this could be its own presentation. It's highly capable. Uh, it's essentially doing pipelining um, engineered data. 
Uh, part of our flow was to create the SQL database of this engineered data that I'm going to show you next. Uh, that SQL data can now be built as a DAC pack in Visual Studio, but I think also your uh, ADO pipelines, which will then get uh, pumped to a Docker image and then pushed to a container registry, which at that point, any developer could now pull down these engineered data solutions and then do testing and development against purely synthetic data at scale on their local machines. Okay, so our solution showcase. This is all the new stuff we've done around engineered data, uh, the new, our new framework. Uh, Ops 360 is our new, uh, it's not the flight op, it's a smaller piece of our flight operations management tooling. Uh, the two key pieces here is data generator and message replay. Uh, data generator is an Azure function. As I mentioned, we're now adopting more of these um, cloud capabilities. It runs every day. It does three things. It generates flights, generates events, which is considered like our sunny day base event model. And its third step is based on the configuration, we'll now do complex transforms to create exception scenarios. And I'll get all these things here when I go into um, in detail here in a few minutes. Next is our message replay. Also, it is an Azure function that runs every minute and essentially reads from the database of all those messages that the data generator built and places them on their specific queues at the time they're needed. And it updates the Rose's process. So when it reads the next time, it's, it's only picking up net new data. So let's look at generate flights. Uh, the generate flights component itself is actually a stored procedure with uh, some complex uh, algorithm logic to it. It does get invoked by data generator, but the key part of it actually reads that config from our flights config table. And can think about flights config as a way of us to essentially parameterize the definition of an airline. Once it runs, it runs the algorithm and outputs those flights to our flights table. So this is, sorry about the nomenclature here. This was originally designed as a stored procedural pass parameters, but it's now in a table. So we're now building, building blocks of how do you define an airline? Well, first we've got our, uh, when do we want it to start? And how long is that flight gonna be? And what's the kind of distance or padding until the next flight? So that now gives us one building block. This is one piece of data to essentially say, I could now create an airline of one flight, but we wanted to get bigger. So how do we do that? Well, those early approaches we told you about were uh, doing sequential data across time. So we now have that same tail number, we'll sequentially using that, those data parameters start stacking on more flights after it. But we now we want to solve parallel problems. We want to have more than just one sequence. So we can now have another parameter for number of aircraft. Okay, so now we can build bigger blocks. Okay, um, this is, just so you know, all of this engineering design was actually around performance testing some of our uh, systems and this is that approach. And so anybody from the performance background will really understand this because this is usually how you set up your ramp ups of however many concurrent uh, clients you want and spinning up at what interval. Well, that's typical from a client perspective. We're actually now approaching this from our data creation perspective. So we can now create uh, a virtual airline at scale. Uh, anecdotally, if you look at this, this would now start creating a, a slanted view and go into this here for a second. So if you were to keep applying that algorithm moving forward, you would get this kind of, those four stages, and then they would um, end, and then the next bank of flights would go, and then this is a way of looking at it, but this isn't the way I want you to look at it. Think about this from the performance perspective. As those are going, you're actually now essentially defining a peak. And so this is why all of this data comes into play We've essentially parameterized uh, all these capabilities for defining what the airline looks like, and we can achieve a very peak number for how many uh, departures we want to have at a time for testing to pair up with our other performance testing. So instead of us trying to performance test what the airline looks like today, we can look performance test what our airline looks like in five years. Uh, building on this a little bit, this is more specific to the airline. This may not interest. Uh, you as much, but this is spe 
specific to us. We need this kind of capabilities is since this is all an algorithm, uh, we have round robin aircraft, which essentially go from point A to point B, then back to point A while maintaining the same flight number. Uh, the next one is multi-leg. That's more like a unidirectional um, while maintaining the same flight number. So we've got our AS-15 goes through its first three stages and then our algorithm likes to keep all the data linked. So it actually increments the flight number for that last stage to bring it back to home base. And then also a circle flight, which maintains the same, the same flight number during the entire loop rotation. And of course I skipped over above, it's you know, pretty straightforward, but uh, the blue box is, you know, same aircraft, uh, having a sequential flight number for each stage. Again, this is specific to the airline. And one of the cool things I wanted to bring out to, to, as a call out, we are pushing our capabilities to the edge. We, we, we started off working really close to the system. And as our capabilities mature, we actually are now adopting uh, by doing this with the native uh, formats that the industry uses. Uh, in this instance, this is actually a SIM file, which is a standard scheduled information module. And it's how those airlines I mentioned as being partners can exchange their schedule so that they can book those connecting flights. It uses this concept of uh, onward flight number for the next day. And so our algorithm automatically, since it is a pretty basic algorithm, but it allows us to still test it and be functional, uh, works this way. And it's given us really cool capabilities by actually building industry standard engineered data files that we can load into our systems. Okay, so that was the generate uh, flights component. Now we're taking the next step, which is step two, which is generate uh, event space. This is that life cycle of events, the out, off, on, in that I previously mentioned. The one at the top is SFA, which is uh, short for uh, schedule flight ad. And it would have generated all these flights and all of these data bits specifying with those flights. So this is actually the framework. And we now have our times for when the actual uh, out message uh, value would get recorded. And it kind of gets inherited and all messages past that point. So as time goes on, it keeps carrying in all those previous events that occurred. And on the far right, we say type. Uh, these are inserts because this is the base event. There was nothing before it. It's just doing an insert. Okay, so we now have our base events. Well, let's now cr start creating a more complex scenario. This is now how we start doing those exception scenarios. So our framework now allows us to sim simulate these exception scenarios. And what we're going to do today is a div, uh, which is short for divert. So instead of going Seattle LAX, we're going to go to Seattle to San Diego. Uh, you notice in the far right, this is a insert event, but also a transform. So it actually puts a new message into that uh, replay table that's a, of a div type, but then it actually goes and grabs all the downline messages that occur after that and applies the transform that you see in red and changes the destination of those to San Diego, but also changes the ops types to divert. Okay, well, you're asking yourself, okay, Ryan, you now have diverted this flight, but this is going to a different station. That's not realistic that it could make it to the other station the same amount of time. I'm like, you're right, well, we can solve that. Uh, UD is short for unknown delay. This is an event that we have in there and I call it a stealth event because it doesn't actually, there's no such event as called unknown delay. All we're doing is doing a transform of downline events. So this one is a unknown delay based on the on event and we want to add 30 minutes to it. And so now that uh, on message and all those downline messages has now been updated. You're like, well, Ryan, this still doesn't make sense because it's now landing at uh, 1300, but it's inning at 1240. So it's, it's totally off. Well, all we have to do is keep on bolting on our customized events to this to fix that. So we now apply uh, an unknown delay on the in message and push it back 30 minutes as well. And so what this framework essentially does is it builds up all of those uh, base inserts. And depending on the scenario that you describe, we'll apply the transforms to all the downline messages to simulate what you need. And this 
is a, uh, what I call our design considerations document. That is uh, essentially a place I use to gather all of those different rules for those events. Not to scare you, but there's about 30 more columns to the right and about 20 more events below this. But you can kind of do a quick glance of this and see uh, all the custom business rules we have in our framework to accommodate uh, everything that we're doing. Uh, one key one we have to call out is the conditional actual times that actually, as you start inserting new events, it actually detects its context in relation to other events that have already fired and conditionally displays those values. Um, payload transforms. This is where a lot of the work is happening and for uh, building this framework. So there's a lot of, as soon as you start doing these unique scenarios, you now need to accommodate for that. And there's a lot of places in those downline messages to start adding new objects, removing objects, or applying date time transforms to them. Using this framework, we were now able to simulate any scenario that uh, the business has come up with. We did not have these capabilities before. And I, I just can't say it enough. Like it's, this is a lot of hard work. Uh, me working with the Ops 360 team, uh, they were all the developers building the actual functions, but which was great because uh, as a developer perspective, uh, we got to bring them into actually doing data. So when they develop a function, they're more on the consuming side. Hey, I get a message. I need to make it and push it to a database and apply some business logic. But we now brought them to say, step to the left. You now need to be able to build data that could exercise your function. So now that they knew what they were consuming, they now have also to build uh, something that produced what they were consuming. So this is a really good exercise for us as a company for a working with our developers to give them new capabilities, but also for our, uh, our uh, product owner team. By them giving us all their scenarios, we were able to now uh, build all these custom events to handle anything I need. What's next? Well, we've been doing this uh, engineered approach for several years since 2017 and these new capabilities we have we want to keep, take this across to our entire test environment. But that's a big task, a big ask as well. And so in practicality, we're going to, have to probably incrementally uh, implement it across different applications so that they can abide by the particular data model. Best practices. I uh, covered on some of these that are going along, but I'll go into some more here, is create an isolated environment where you can go do this at so you're not fighting with uh, organic real data coming in. Uh, you can still analyze that data elsewhere, but just you don't want to do it here. Um, have we? Well, we have done data blending. It's not fun, but it is doable. It requires a lot of extra work on your um, you know, engineering folks because you'll see, uh, like in our example, we'll see some flights that come in all looking nice, precise. Then I'll go to organic data, looks all kind of messy, and then back and it's kind of hard to troubleshoot. Like, where did this data come from? Uh, next is um, analyze. My background is actually in systems engineering and protocol analysis. So that's what really helped me in this role. Uh, but it's reviewing architecture documents, really understanding these complex applications and what they connect to and where that data comes from. Also reviewing the code. Uh, we've spent many, many an hour of review, doing code review to figure out what were they trying to do with this and kind of tells you where um, what it was trying to do and where it's going. Configurations are the same. Uh, when we were trying to troubleshoot some environments to get them hooked up, sometimes we would they would get pointed to a developer machine or another test machine or QA or some other location for to pull in a config or feature. And so we had to really hammer that out. And we actually had a uh, release coordinator help us with that. Uh, analyze the data. And this is the place where I spent the absolute most amount of time is to understand your environment uh, what you're usually testing, you're actually usually testing the data uh, in your system. But for us, since we're an airline, real-time logistics, business processes, we had to analyze events as well, and a little bit of um, uh, Fiddler and Wireshark analysis of traffic. So we couldn't understand how a few things happen. Like, why is this one thing firing? There was like a, a callback process elsewhere that was making data kick off. So we had to use not just, you know, business knowledge and architecture knowledge, but also just some good old um, analysis. Resolve your data issues. I covered this a lot up front. 
uh, resolving your event issues. Again, it depends on your market. Uh, what does that what does that eventing look like? Are you doing you know pure orchestrated events or just um, business processes? And if you can use engineered data, I didn't really dive into that too much in this presentation, but it's really getting to using patterns and numbers and uh, creating derived relationships and data to solve these complex problems. If you can do build up teardown, that's better for you because that's super fast and tight. Leverage your SMEs. Uh, we got so much, uh, I've been in this space for a long time, but even on this most recent project, working with the SME, I got to have a nice section of um, understanding their perspective of how the event should be consumed and interpreted. Even though my framework handled it and didn't really matter to me, but now allow me to understand how he thought. The last piece is thinking big. Uh, for us, these are all big solutions. Uh, if we were to try to solve this by one, looking at one service and then going to the next, we would lose visibility and have to do a lot of rework to maintain it under the same umbrella. And that's kind of like why the same problems everybody runs into in the real world by this system's not in sync with this one and behaves different. By having this think big approach to solving these problems, you can now kind of keep it all under one umbrella. And, Brian, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Your team <laughs> and how you run it, if it's purely agile or uh, if you're trying to solve these bigger problems. Thank you well, so, so much, Brian. Look for any questions if there's time. So I apologize. We we don't have time for questions because we ran a touch over, which happens. Um, but I yeah. highly recommend if you have questions for Ryan, please, please, please reach out to him on LinkedIn um, and he will gladly you know, get back to you, I hope. Um, and now what I'd like to do is bring on our next speaker, uh, Dinesh. Um, and Dinesh is going to talk about leveraging di digital workforces for UAT automation. Welcome, Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Oh, my, I hope I'm audible. You are. I can hear you. I can see you. Great. We just got to switch the, uh, the screen share. There we go. Uh, much better. Yeah, so we can hear you, we can see you, and we're all set for you. Go ahead and share your slides. Okay, um, I've started sharing my screen. I hope that's that comes up. Great. We got it. Thank you so okay. much. Good enough. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, everyone, for joining this uh, virtual summit. And thank you, Sable Tech, for allowing me to deliver the speech on this topic of uh, leveraging digital workforce for UAD automation. A topic that I'm uh, pretty uh, deeply involved and interested. So, because I have a lot of uh, experience on the UAD side of things and being associated with the digital workforce practice at CAPCO. Uh, before we could get in, a quick introduction um, about myself. Uh, I'm a principal at uh, CAPCO in the wealth management and technology practice. Uh, CAPCO specializes in technology and management consultancy for financial services. So all my experience has been into financial services uh, domain. The examples uh, that I would go and but that I would be uh, sharing as a part of this presentation will be uh, around the financial services industry, uh, but it could be applied you know, the technology, as we all know, can be applied to uh, any industry, not just financial services. It's, you know, it's industry agnostic. So I come with 20 plus years of technology consulting experience, you know, uh, have executed a large number of agile uh, projects, agile and waterfall uh, transformation projects uh, across uh, wealth management, cap markets, uh, commercial and retail banking. My technology experience has been in largely in the project management, program management, business analysis, test management, and biz dev. Currently, I'm uh, associated, I'm managing a business critical uh, program for a wealth platform digitization project that my client is delivering to their client, uh, which is responsible for you know, getting 6,000 plus financial advisors on this platform. So I'm managing a large cross-functional team as a part of that program. My other hobbies include photography and I'm a professional voice actor as well. Done voice acting in YouTube commercials, radio ads, and audiobooks. 
Uh, I am a robotic operating model architect and a PSM and a PMP certified professional. Well, okay. Uh, let's get on with the agenda for this uh, presentation. So we will we are going to talk about uh, largely leveraging the technologies, the advanced technologies uh, in the digital workforce, and how could that be applied on for UAT automation. Uh, we will be covering how has UAT transformed over a period of uh, you know right in early two thousand uh, till till now, how the UAT's faith has changed over a period of time. You look through the automation spectrum and where what, what are the different types of automation that we know about that you know our other colleagues and uh, on this on this summit have talked about. Uh, we will largely focus on two key technologies: the model-based testing and uh, robots automation. They are the two key technologies that we will be talking about with respect to the UAD automation. Where can it be applied, and how to go about applying it? And certainly the risks and challenges. You know, there, are the, there are the risks and challenges in any new technology, any anything that we adopt. Uh, an interesting uh, uh, line that I read you know, by Dr. Edward Deming. So, you know, which only means that change is the only constant. You know, if you, yeah, if we don't change the survival it's difficult, yeah. Uh, it, hence, it is funnily put here that it's not necessary to change because survival is not mandatory. Yeah. But in order to be in business, you need to survive. The organizations have to survive if if they happen to be if they were in the business. So let's look at how the UAD has transformed since early two thousand. So. Historically, you know, when the Agile manifesto was not in place, when largely the projects were waterfall oriented, the projects used to be a big bang projects. You know, uh, the UAT or the user acceptance test has always came towards the extreme right of the project life cycle. You know? The focus of automation when it, we talk about automation, was never on UAT. You know? It was focus of automation how it was largely on automating the test cases for functional testing, system testing, traditional automation tools, U UF, say UFT, Selenium, and others. Yeah. So today, with the with the proliferation of digital technologies, uh, agile, DevOps, it is critical to automate the entire life cycle, and that's what we have seen. You know, uh, uh, over a period of time. So where largely, historically, it's, it was it was a big bang, UAT as the penultimate phase, the no-go, no-go decision used to be at the very, very end. Uh, largely, there was no, no formal feedback loop and no holistic uh, testing, I should say, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to, or to overarch the customer journeys. Things started improving. We we then saw a hybrid model uh, coming into play. Uh, it was again the UAT used to be towards the very right of the project lifecycle, but at least there we we started seeing some feedback loop. So not the entire project goes. It was you know it in in chunks. But for every every uh, scope of work that goes live, there was a UAT towards the end, and then any feedback used to get incorporated in in, in the subsequent uh, delivery project delivery. So there was a feedback loop, but again, the cost of uh, quality was high. The cost of implementing a change coming as feed coming as a feedback from UAT has been uh, high. Uh, and over the past, I would say, 2015 onwards, the slowly and steadily we have seen that the UAT have started moving, moving left. You know, uh, has been shifting left. Uh, it is embedded in squads and fleets at the user story, epic, and proposition level. 
you know, the users uh, have either so just to you know uh, level set when we talk about uat not necessarily we always talk about the end ops users who uh, you know, uh, who would participate in the user story. They may and they, they do as well. But largely, you know, we have also seen that the UAT as, uh, as a model, as a business has been, you know, uh, outsourced or there is a business partner, you know, uh, who would come in and help the, uh, the bank or the organization to perform the UAT. So, <clears throat> And we do a lot of that kind of work as well. And we've seen that the UAT is hence getting embedded in into these cycles and hence more of iteratively. UAT gets into either is uh, is executed in sprint or out of sprint, but at least it is a part of that iterative cycle. I would say multidisciplinary teams involved are empowered uh, to to adjust to the requirements uh, and, and testing to 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 bring out the opt optimum value to the program. Uh, and because testing and UAT is inherent in the squads across the customer journeys, you know, uh, the product is released to the production as soon as the UAT is complete. Whether it is released on production or not, that's a business decision, but at least the product is ready for go live. <clears throat> so we have seen this transformation you know, of, of, of UAT. And uh, because of this transformation in the UAT, it is important to understand that how could we now look at automating the UAT? Uh, the question could still be then that okay fine you know that automation is has largely been the sit or the pre-prod uh, uh, testing function you know what is the value we could derive out of automating uad as such so why to automate uad so let's look at this automation has been uh, limited to high level regression scenarios that may or may not capture the application functionalities, <clears throat> the crucial application functionalities that uh, that goes live, that are you know at every end at the end of every uh, cycle, or at, at the end of every iteration. Existing automation framework is time consuming, uh, you know, which are which is largely focused on API slash backend testing. And it's time consuming, not able to keep pace with, not always being able to keep pace with the development efforts. So it's, it's, there is a lag always, you know, when, there's, when we talk about these automation technologies. Uh, and because of that, the user acceptance has to be conducted manually, largely. Uh, regression automation, again, uh, not thorough resulting in regression defects. You know, I mean, the regression defects coming out in UAT is, is a result of that concept because not always the regression scripts are able to keep, uh, keep up, are able to keep the pace with development efforts. Uh, and uh, I touched upon this, that the automation largely, you know, focuses on backend uh, testing. So key user interface based user stories, uh, are then, are hence carried out manually. So delivery cycles, they are getting shortened. Requirements change so often, you know, gone are the days that all the histor the, the, the functional specifications were written all through in hundreds and hundreds of FR pages of FR FRD, and then it is being developed, and then UAT, we are, we are, we are far off, you know, if we left that, uh, that phase behind, thankfully so. Uh, and these automation frameworks that are that are currently in in uh, in use, uh, they are certainly costlier to maintain. Uh, they have its own value. I'm not undermining the effort or the value that you know an automation engineer would would bring onto the table. 
you know, uh, here we are talking about engaging how to engage the UAT, you, uh, you know, UAT uh, users or UAT testers in uh, the whole uh, gamut of testing soon, testing fast, uh, because UAT is moving in sprint and businesses are adopting this shift left phenomena. They, are, they want the testers, the users to be involved in, in, in requirements gathering, in requirements documentation and elicitation. That's why we have these roles of product owners who, who are pseudo users as such. And, uh, and, and with, with the advancement of technologies, you know, the, the uh, many, many firms have started coming up with a low code, no code software. And uh, I was hearing our colleague Jenna, the Jenna's uh, presentation earlier this morning about how, you know, the, the low code and no code technologies have made its way into automation largely. Uh, Again, talking about uh, automation as a whole, it is gaining prominence. Some of the statistics that I have put in into the uh, uh, on the slide, you know, this is taken from the World Quality Report. The or UAT automation has been gaining prominence. The last what I read was around twenty percent of UAT being automated across industries. You know, uh, large. Part of this 20% has been I've seen is 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 in retail and in financial services. Uh, so it is gaining prominence. We used to talk about quality uh, at speed. Uh, we used to talk about uh, how how we could deliver all the test cases faster. But here we are talking. We, we have to know that it is not just quality, but we are also delivering value at speed, and that is that is only possible when we when we adapt when we adopt the change. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's look at the you know the what are the levels of automation. Okay. Uh, so automation spectrum. So this. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of keywords, a lot of words here. I'll just quick, you know, let you know what exactly are these. So, uh, left portion of the slide are, are the technologies that are that that are largely rules based. You know, there is no cognitive decision making by the machine that is involved. So that's where the foundational automation comes into play. You know, the VB Excel macros or the the hotkeys that uh, that resides on the user's machine right the, a little bit you know may you'd find many users getting going in and doing their automation for their own like you know writing a quick excel macros because they they know about writing how to write the excel macros vb script so they would do it and that resides on that machine those are like those we call categorize as largely foundational automation moving up the value chain we then talk about model based testing how the tests are right, written, created, like how the tests are being executed by creating models. And then, you know, uh, uh, moving further, we talk about robotic process automation, the two technologies that we will be talking about. Further up when we go, we have intelligent automation, artificial intelligence, sometimes used interchangeably. Some say artificial intelligence is, kind of, you know, intelligent automation is a hybrid of RPA and in, uh, artificial intelligence. Whatever it is, you know, I'm not going to go into the terms and the meanings of it. The the message here is that intelligent automation, artificial intelligence are largely judgment based, wherein the machine is making a decision, you know, uh, uh, on behalf of humans. Uh, very simple examples of this being, you know, Netflix giving you results based on your browsing. Uh, uh, Google Home, uh, you know, uh, I, I remember Google Home. Uh, you know, you could you could put in uh, uh, a message in in an alarm, for example. So we used to put in our daughter's name in there. I did, it didn't used to pronounce it well. It didn't used to pronounce the way we used to do it. But over a period of time, it started pronouncing the way it used to, because you know, you know that Google Home is always listening. So that's 
it, it basically the machine learned and then adapted to the change. So where the intelligent automation and artificial intelligence are more judgment based, here we are looking at rule based automation. Right? And that's what we are going to focus on the robotic process automation and model based testing. <clears throat> because uh, practically we are we are not although this this uh, you know from a, from the uh, the business impact of ia and ai is far more but the cost of implementing is way too high so it you know the, the question is are businesses able to derive the value out of it you know so <clears throat> let's look at each of them let's look at the model based testing uh, by the way, the the uh, you know all these uh, names here, they are the product companies which offer the softwares like I don't know Curiosity, Broadcom has ARD Agile requirement decider. Curiosity has test modeler for model based testing, robotic process automation. Many of us I'm sure know about automation anywhere, Blue Prism, UiPath, WorkFusion, and these companies also now offer IA and AI platforms. Right. So let's look at the first one, which is model-based testing. You know, UAT automation using model-based testing. Now, the, it, it is important to understand uh, why uh, we why I have chosen these two in particular. Uh, let's look at the model-based testing, and we can I'll, I'll touch upon on, on that 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 question if at all anyone has that. Hold on to that thought. <clears throat> Model-based testing. So, in simple terms, you know, as the definition states here, it's a black box testing. It's a black box testing process, which means we are not looking at the the code. We are not getting. We don't need a, a automation engineer with a you know with a coding background to adopt model-based testing. Uh, it's a black box testing for derivation of test cases. That's important. It's a, you, the test cases are derived automatically. You know, you're not writing test cases on an Excel or HPQC or Jira or whatever. You know? These test cases are derived out of the models. So think it this way, that any, uh, every, well, any tester you know, uh, would generally mentally create those models that what are the different scenarios I would want to test. Yeah. So scenarios and the test cases, so at least the scenarios are clear in, in the mind and that gets translated into these test cases that gets documented. So here in the model based testing, what we are referring to is that the user creates those models in the form of flowcharts, right? What is the scenarios, large number of scenarios that I would want to test. Yeah. And the system is generating test cases and eventually executing them as well. So these test execution or generation of test cases is happening automatically based on with, with the help of these models. The models could be created in the in the in the form of flowcharts. It could be created in the form of a, you know a BDD, you know, uh, GWT formats. So black box testing process for derivation of test cases from a model that describes the functional aspects of system under, system under test. Uh, different functionalities, different scenarios that needs to be tested are translated into models and executing those test cases as well. So, and uh, there's a feedback loop established at every point as, as we see here on, on, on the screen. You know, an author, uh, okay, a, a, a UAD tester would come up with the model scenarios, you know, these, uh, these models get translated into test cases, uh, varied number of test cases, which can be reviewed, you know, which can be reviewed by the UAD tester, uh, whether these, the test case that the system has generated, is it, is it the correct one or we need to, we don't need to test those, you can just, you know, check, uncheck them and uh, tag the test data that needs to be associated with those scenarios. The test data, again, could be automatically generated uh, or it could be fed with the help of an you know, uh, Excel sheet or whatever. 
you know, whatever software uh, is required. It could be as simple as a basic Excel sheet being plugged into the into the you know the the the, the MBT software, and then it picks up the data while it exit while it executes the test cases. <laughs> So, and there's a feedback loop established as part of when you're generating the model and executing those uh, executing those test cases. So, one clear cut, uh, you know, uh, benefit as we see the the it is it reduces the test scripting time drastically. Yeah. Uh, so. 95% reduction of test case scripting time. That's what we have seen. Reduction of test maintenance because maintaining a test script is not going into the code. It is all through the flowcharts. You don't need a scenario because requirements have changed. Do it immediately, right? And again, designed overall designing execution time, we see a drastic improvement there. Uh, this is very much uh, flexible, I would say. Right, because there are these flowcharts, we could change, update, remove any time we need. Which means that if an application is undergoing a change, you know, a uh, new product being implemented where the requirements are still not clear, you know, we are going in iterative cycles. We can certainly use model-based testing. Model-based testing would create these. These models are, are in the form of flowcharts. We, we have developed them, these models. Uh, in the next sprint or the next cycle, there's a change in the requirement. It's very easy to go and change the, the flow chart, you know, because there's no uh, interference uh, from the back end or any coding required from that respect. Uh, a, a quick pro flow, like the way it is, it is done. So requirement modeling, it is continuously done. You know, a, a BA or a, or, or a product owner would would document these models or import from a Gherkin, Gherkin specifications, you know, business diagrams or test cases or or even the log files. They they are in they are incorporated in, into this into the tool. The test cases, as we see here, are are then accordingly. Uh, once the model is created, the system will uh, evaluate and generate the test cases the number of test cases coming out of that scenario is automatically you know the optimized test cases are generated directly in in, a, in the in the flowchart fashion and the test data i talked about the test case, test data is uh, again you know automatically fed automatically generated or it can be fed in the form of a uh, excel or a word doc or whatever you know that the that the software uh, intakes uh, so here again it's important because it's a low code slash no code platform it doesn't need the skills of an automation engineer to come in and uh, you know generate these test cases or write the automation test cases because uh, many of you would agree the end users not always are you know tech savvy or even the business partners that who are who are who are conducting the UAT or pseudo U, pseudo UAT users, uh, they are not tech savvy. They are largely business people or from a different background, which but not not always technology. So it's easier for them to pick up this uh, model based testing as a concept <clears throat> because it is all flowcharts. See, so model based testing can be easily used for a, a product which keep changing the you know the, the requirements are very fluid and it's not finalized yet so in financial services industry we talk we, we call this as ctb change the bank the other aspect of it is rtb run the bank where the systems are already live they needs to be updated there there are updates to those platforms you know but the systems are live that those application needs to be maintained or up updated based on the change in the business functions so where model based testing is used or highly recommended for ctb functions change the bank functions rpa would be more uh, i was a beneficial for 
RTB functions where the systems are matured. It is on the on this go live. It's already live, but there is a need for a continuously maintaining those applications here yeah, because there are changes to the products, new functions being added. Yeah. So RPA, you know, this is a subject close to my heart. Robotic process automation. What is RPA? It is a software with automation capability. You know, it's it has a robotic process robot uh, in the name. Doesn't mean there are the physical robots coming in executing those testing. It is a machine which executes the test, uh, uh, executes a process. It's a virtual workforce, you know, that emulates the human activity that any human would do. A machine is doing the that, right? So hence, RPA it, it get gets categorized as a rule based technology it's not there's no judgment machine is not taking decisions it is all rule based if this scenario happens this is what the machine should do you know from a navigation perspective from a workflow perspective uh, so hence it's it is uh, to be incorporated for systems which are matured which has a lot of repetitive tasks Historically, robotic process automation, or even now, it is being used largely on automating the uh, business processes. The like ops users coming in in the morning, there's an email, and that email needs to be opened. There's an Excel sheet there, some basic formula to be applied, and then that email needs to be sent out to a large number of folks. Right? So that repetitive uh, process <clears throat> has to be, or can be, automated using the robotic process automation. Or RPA, the obviously it is you know it 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 works on an existing architecture. So it doesn't need a separate hardware that to come in and then you know the to be to be implemented. It comes, it, it existing servers that are being in in play that needs to be you know uh, that can, that has to be that can be leveraged. It is controlled by the business operations. You know it doesn't. It is governed by the IT because it sits on the platform, but not necessarily that it has to be you know. Uh, it has to be controlled by the IT function and available day and night you know it's a it's a machine can can run anytime you know all through the day so in simple terms rpa technique to automate business process of or human tasks it's an interesting concept uh many places it, i mean some of the examples it can be used is uh, from a financial services industry I come from. I'll give you some examples like in payment reconciliations where the validation of time consuming repetitive scenarios can be automated. Trade execution, like I will see a demo of, of an RPF, so simple trade execution. Uh, KYC, AML, you know, or the claims payment. These are all the functions which are very mundane and repetitive. So any changes to these functions can be automated when these tests, when these scenarios, when these functions are being tested. So, where can it? Be, what can be automated using RPA? What applications, uh, which are, which has a predefined decision tree? As I said, it's a rule-based, a repetitive process, right? Uh, uh, it has a fixed predefined data structures. The data structure is not changing. You know, the metadata is not changing every now and then. It's not about implementing RPA for an application that's, that keeps changing. It's for a mature application. Uh, the IT, the, the application spans across, you know, the process spans across multiple applications. Only then the, you know, put uh, buying an RPA license would add value. Uh, it has to be, have a significant volume. There has to be a lot of lot of different scenarios to be tested you know multiples of, of very high volumes in order to be uh, to justify the need for an rpa and process is not emerging or or adjusted frequently it's you know it it is it's pretty mature uh, so for for these different areas for these different uh, scenarios i would say uh, the rpa uh, is, is more beneficial. Let's took let's take a look at uh, you know a small demo here for order of of an RPA. So what we have here, what I'm going to play here is uh, uh, it's, it's from this is from a U this is from a, a Blue Prism um, uh, this is from a Blue Prism platform. So what you here have here on the right is the uh, 
just give me a second. Yeah. Okay. What you have here on the right is the is the RPA itself. You know the way it has been it has been uh, documented in the form of flowcharts. Again, there is no coding involved. And on the left here, what we see is the is an application. It's a dummy application here, and order order. It's it's basically a simple trade order uh, application on the left. So here, what we if we see that when the application is running so we could we could see how the the blue this rpa tool is executing a particular scenario so what it does it is loading the orders from an excel sheet it is opening up an application all we see here on the left it application is opened the order number is inputted and on the right we see how our how is this executed this is a real life rpa you know, uh, flow chart that is, or, or we call it as bot. A bot is running. So a new a new uh, order is is pub is inputted. The order is submitted, and then a new, and again it navigates through that Excel sheet, takes another order, and then puts in. And then and this way it completes all the orders that are there in an Excel. You know, the source could be anything. Here it is Excel sheet. The orders are inputted one by one into the application automatically so all what needs to be done is the, is to be this this bot which is to be documented written here and then it executes the uh, the functions using this this flow chart <clears throat> maintaining this flow maintaining this again is so very uh, is is easy because there's no coding involved here it is all based on the flow charts if then else and at the end of it as we see it is sending an email it's sending an email to you know whoever so it 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 interfaces with excel interfaces with the application and sending finally with microsoft office okay so that is what that was a quick thing uh, we are almost about time i um, will quickly look at uh the risks and challenges uh, earlier today jenna had a very nice slide talking about various risks these are these are mimicking this almost same you know whenever we talk about new technology we have we come up with employee we, we have resistance uh, we have ownership issues you know the the uh, there was a decision paralysis point that uh, you know uh, that was talked about that jenna talked about uh, and uh, ownership like who's who's going to own this whole RPA platform? Would that be IT? Would that be business? How the maintenance to be done? And uh, you know, uh, and if there is a change in the organization strategy, uh, who's going to own this? How is the this RPA going to get 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 maintained? These bots are going to be maintained. Yeah. Uh, so this is pretty much uh, what I wanted to cover. Um, any any questions uh, that uh, you know you have anyone has you could certainly uh, I can see uh, there's a, there are a couple of questions uh, main risks for organization uh, as we just just covered a few risks employee resistance business case scenarios it has to add value you know, because of the kind of licenses that you uh, that 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 needs. I've seen that you know uh, when we recommend when we propose RPA platform for to our clients, we we largely recommend UAT automation using RPA for those firms which uh, has an RPA license already, which are the firms which are using RPA for for their process automation. You know, so that the uh, the, the testing organization doesn't have to. Uh, invest separately on a license if they have an existing rpa license which they are using for their process automation you know that straight away can be leveraged for uat automation there we have seen uh, a larger adoption you know uh, as against uh, bringing in an rpa tool separately only for uat automation that's what i have seen largely okay. uh, Okay, I've seen a couple of questions, Mo. Uh, okay, there was one question. Look at trends in the automated testing market. See, I think some of it I covered. Uh, 
automated testing, uh, you know, things are moving uh, very fast, I would say. Uh, adoption of advanced technologies, uh, some of them we covered. Uh, but yes, the proliferation of this low code, no code so uh, software and tools have, have, uh, have are sweeping the markets. You know, they, they, they are taking over other, uh, you know, other, uh, tools, technologies that are in market because if something is available with low code, no code, why to invest in uh, in something where you need required uh, automation skills? Thank you so much. Um, you know, it looks like there may have been one more question and I think we covered it some, which is what are the main risks for the organization? Um, anything additional you wanted to point out on that one? No, I did cover that, Jenna, uh, okay. first. I think I, I took that so. question first. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I love how they kind of, like, our talks kind of work together. I want to chat with you more on that at some point. Sure. Um, <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> um, so, folks, we have come to our last break. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break that's going to take us to, let's see, 140, which is 20 minutes from 19 minutes from now. And when we come back, we'll have our last speaker of the day. So uh, go ahead, take a break, grab some coffee, you know, all that good stuff. And we'll see you back in just a little bit.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, hope your break was good and you got some caffeine and a snack. I know I did. Um, so I'm very excited to bring our last speaker to the stage. Um, I'd like to welcome Smith, and he's going to talk about AI and ML and test automation. It's like, there we go. Hi, Sumit. Hello. Excited to have you. Can't wait to see your talk. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having a wonderful opportunity. Uh, looking forward to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in test automation. And uh, also, I would like to talk about some of the use cases which we can probably, uh, you know, see or maybe uh, if anyone wants to implement, uh, they can look for it. So yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> it's almost uh, 12, 10 a.m. Uh, <laughs> in India. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully you're as caffeinated as I am then. <laughs> um, and if you want to go ahead and share your slides, we can get started. All right. Okay. <clears throat> awesome. uh, just let me share the screen. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, if you're going to just help me with, you're able to see my slides. Is it visible? I hope you can see the slides. All right, okay, so I am starting. Okay, so yeah, um, uh, once again, uh, welcome to everyone uh, for this session on artificial intelligence and machine learning in test automation. My name is Sumit Mundara. Um, I am working with uh, Vodafone Voice India and I'm taking care for automation test activity here. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, uh, you know, basically what is artificial intelligence is all about, what is machine learning, um, just so that uh, we can understand uh, basically how it works uh, and the way uh, the models are getting built. Okay. And then uh, by understanding that we can kind of uh, look for, you know, some of the challenges which we have in the test automation, uh, which possibly, you know, uh, the machine uh, learning and AI ML can, you know, uh, basically solve. Okay. So uh, in terms of today's agenda, uh, we will be talking about the evolution of software testing, uh, you know, the, how the software testing is evolved uh, we will start about the journey how the traditional automation was happening and now is happening you know what is happening uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence uh, we will be talking about uh, an overview about uh, what is ai ml uh, and specifically you know the core and a subset of the machine learning which is a deep learning um, and again uh, this these things we are sharing just so that we understand what basically it it looks like uh, we will be talking about some of the approaches of machine learning and then uh, as i did mention about uh, you know why we need uh, artificial intelligence in test automation uh, so we will go back we will see some of the challenges uh, which we have in you know uh, traditional test automation and how we can you know kind of uh, fix them by using artificial intelligence and machine learning so that's about uh, you know uh, 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 about the topic, and then we will look some of the use cases, and then we will go for a summary. Right. Um, just I'm taking a confirmation. Um, I hope uh, uh, Jenna, uh, you can see the slides and you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So. Uh, let me jump into the topic now, uh, evaluation for the software testing, how it happened. So uh, we started with a, you know, a kind of functional testing or a manual testing when the quality assurance started. Uh, that was an era where uh, there were no automation tools or even there was not like a kind of you know, bulky or a huge requirement in terms of test automation. Uh, then came an era, you know, wherein uh, we got a, a lot of uh, automation, you know, getting started. Uh, but uh, this particular decade was completely, you know, uh, busy with uh, the bulky tool, uh, which are very heavy in nature. 
uh, maybe you can talk about uh, record and play kind of tools which are bulky in nature um, they can do automation but end of the day uh, the maintenance or the cost was very high uh, they were not scalable uh, and they were not able to adopt with the with the pace okay uh, now uh, necessity is the mother of mother of invention right so then came you know the era and i think we are almost you know uh, at end and somehow we are overlapping uh, with the artificial intelligence which is taking over uh, which is about how the traditional software testing methodologies uh, you know have been evolved so uh, we have agile we have devops we have uh, you know a requirement of having a continuous testing continuous feedback and by looking all those perspective um, and by looking the uh, way the software testing methodologies uh, have been evolved uh, there was a need of having you know a faster automation and automation which can scale uh, which can give you result on a timely manner or you know we we wanted to go back more in terms of shift left and things like that uh, and honestly, uh, when we are into that at the same time, uh, and that's why I was mentioning, we are somewhere, you know, overlapping uh, between the uh, uh, um, this advancement of a software test, uh, uh, testing methodologies and then uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, okay, which is taking care or, you know, going in our product. Uh, we have a product which are built on AIML. Then we have... Uh, artificial intelligence machine learning coming into the way uh, the traditional automation is used to be happening and now that is what we're going to see you know uh, what are those particular or particular areas which can be looked uh, as in you know uh, ai ml use cases so that is how uh, you know we started with an evaluation i will try to uh, i have i have you know um, i particularly have this slide because i wanted to connect the dot at end when we will be talking about uh, you know a quick summary we will try to see how the evaluation is always helpful if we take it in the right sense and we use technology wisely now let's talk about artificial intelligence so this image uh, i have taken you know uh, the definition from the wikipedia uh, in in a sense, artificial intelligence is intelligence uh, which was demonstrated by the machine as opposed to human, right? So here we are using something which we call a machine learning. Now, artificial to have an artificial intelligence, right? How it works is it relies on you know some of the machine learning fundamentals, the approaches which we will see. But let's consider you know what happens in machine learning so it is basically a study of the computer algorithms okay you have a varieties of algorithms uh, which play on the data okay and then automatically give you some kind of a result now i just want to take a little bit pause here to help you understand uh, basically how it works i mean we have all um, you know seen somewhere or we have learned about the probabilities we have learned about you know some of the uh, use cases in the traditional mathematics right if you are uh, tossing a coin and what is the probability of getting his head or tail right uh, so let's take this example and try to understand that you have some data and then you have some kind of you know uh, different different input and you are looking for an output right well just expand this particular concept when we talk about the machine learning and he'll try to understand that in machine learning uh, depending upon the problem and a context you get a different different you know uh, kind of a flavor uh, what are they we will see that now but let's see uh, what is the what is the most important part here uh, the most important part here is the data, right? So you get a data, uh, you you play on that data, uh, the most important time, a significant time, I would probably say, goes in data cleanup activity. You want to come to a proper feature set uh, where you have an interest. Uh, if you are having an output already defined, that you're looking for some kind of a problem statement uh, where the output is already defined, okay? Or maybe you are looking for uh, output and you know the output, like what you are looking for. At that time, you will go for supervised learning example and then you will be using this uh, machine learning algorithm on that cleanup data uh, and you will see different different result uh, the precision recall you will play with all those parameters your f1 score and then you will come to a, a significant point that fine uh, on this probability or on this particular output i'm fine with my you know the result and then you will deploy the model uh, then comes uh, another subset, a core part of machine learning, uh, wherever there is a complex problem situations arises, which we call as a deep learning, right? So you must have heard the word, uh, you know, convolutional neural network, basic neural network. So that is all about deep learning. Now, what happens here in a deep learning is you get more sophisticated algorithm to play, okay? And you can correlate this a little bit uh, in terms of the way uh, the neurons work in our human body, right? So that's about, uh, in a nutshell, what is artificial intelligence all about? Um, how does it look and uh, you know 
uh, how it works in terms of you know when you have uh, uh, the actual data. Now let's try to understand uh, different approaches of machine learning, right? So I will take a little bit more time here uh, so that we understand uh, you know one by one. So let's say the first part is. Uh, 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 one of the part of a machine learning is depending upon the problem statement, whether the problem is going for a supervised learning or unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning. Now, just to understand and remember this concept is when we talk about the supervised learning, we have our output variable already you know, defined. So you have a label data in the supervised learning. So wherever you have output, which you are looking for, and you have a, you know, label data, then that particular problem statement goes to supervised learning. Okay. And example would be the regression uh, problem or a classification problem. Let's take an example of a regression, like weather forecasting. Uh, maybe we want to do a defect prediction. We want to do some kind of a classification. Uh, example would be a, you know, stock market forecasting, or you want to, uh, you know, classify the data. So here, you know, you are, uh, you know, Y variable, the output variable we call in AIML. And then you will be playing, uh, depending upon the problem statement, the regression or kind of a classification algorithm right now let's go back and connect that uh, point which i was just trying to explain that you get a data you play on the data you do data cleanup and as soon as you have a you know proper data you divide data into training and testing set right and then on that training data you will be playing all this algorithm right uh no need to go and mug up the algorithms what are they uh, it is just like if you get a concept the algorithms are already ready they are very sophisticated they will play on a data and then you will get a result uh, if you are fine with the result uh you will use the same algorithm on your testing data again you will see the result and everything goes fine as per your requirement you will be deploying the model second comes unsupervised learning now what happens in unsupervised learning here is uh, we get a problem statement which is not a label data right so when we say it is not a label data now in sense we we are working on hidden parameters right so we are trying to understand from a data itself right and here uh, the problem goes to maybe a clustering or maybe you have a lot of uh, you know input variable and you want to come to a point where uh, a particular uh, you know columns or maybe the feature set are important for you and then you will be doing that kind of a you know reduction of the feature set which we call as a dimensional reduction and then depending upon uh, again the problem statement and a context you will be playing unsupervised learning algorithm now a very good example could be a market segmentation you want to go and you know have your market segmentation ready at that time you will be using a clustering or maybe you want to know uh, there are a defect uh, these defects are categorizing in which kind of area so you want to cluster the defect uh, having a you know common area or interest or a domain uh, or a, uh, an application so that example goes with the unsupervised learning right i'm taking this time so that uh, we can understand first aiml and then we can correlate with uh, how aiml will fit in our software testing areas and or kind of areas and then comes the reinforcement learning uh, i think we all uh, like the game playing the games and uh, a very good example maybe with the example i will start for reinforcement learning is uh, autonomous driving right so here what happens just to understand this reinforcement learning concept uh, basically uh, you get a runtime problem situation right the way we play the game or the way we want to have autonomous driving of our vehicle at that particular time uh, you get you know continuously you know different different variety of a problem statement and you want to decide at runtime how to you know adapt the situation and what could be your next move right so in that case you are continuously learning so we call it as a queue learning or a deep queue network right so that is an example of reinforcement learning uh, just so that uh, uh, we understand everything goes with an algorithm that is what machine learning all about so supervised learning if comes you will be playing with a logistic regression you will be playing with knn and if there is an unsupervised learning problem statement you will be playing with uh, the models or a machine learning algorithm which are related to pca or svd okay so uh, that's about you know how uh, uh, the machine learning works i think by now we understood data is so much important and depending upon the context we play on our data and now we try to adopt uh, i mean uh, you know train uh, our you know our models and then we deploy the models by that by this time uh, uh, you know we are somewhere talking more and more about aiml but what goes to artificial uh, you know automation that's what the topic is right so let's try to understand uh, you know why we need artificial in test automation okay first of all do we need it right so here i'm not going to talk about the problems uh, which cannot be answered uh, 
for now by AML. I will try to put only the you know particular problems uh, which can be addressed by artificial intelligence. And maybe if we have understood a little bit about uh, how the machine learning works, then we can use those kind of uh, you know the context. Uh, to be able to uh, understand the problem okay uh, in machine learning understanding the problem is the most important part and once you understand the problem then you know where to fit that particular problem uh, maybe supervised learning unsupervised learning reinforcement learning uh, train the model and get the result so here always to learn about you know why we need this let's try to understand what are our real problem so the first and the most important problem uh, when it comes to automation and generally all of us uh, you know have noticed is a skill set right so when we talk about uh, uh, you know automation skill set uh, i would say that uh, you know uh, you you might be having a very good uh, skill set in terms of resources so uh, but everyone is not having that thing even if you have automation skill set within your team within your organization but still uh, end of the day we are human and as a human uh, we can make some of the mistakes which can be a, a human related uh, you know mistakes there could be some kind of a typo and things like that uh, maybe when it comes to code review particularly an example you are not able to find out the uh, you know the problem or maybe you are not able to um, address uh, where the optimization can help you at that particular particular time uh, you know uh, auto ai is really a helping hand and and one particular point which i really wanted to address here was uh, when we talk about the uh, you know uh, skill set uh, i think uh, apart from that header maybe we can also talk about efficiency right so end of the day we as a human have you know maybe we can work 10 hours 12 hours but these are the machines these are the models right they can work 24 by 7 and maybe there are mandate action repetitive things which are happening around you and here the machine learning or the AIML can help you to do those kind of activity for you and you can spend that particular time in your creativity or where you have more interest or domain expertise now uh, let's talk about another and most important problem which I think I and everybody around us know is about the maintenance okay so here um, uh, when we talk about and maybe i will take an example of xpath right so uh, it's uh, it's very famous and everybody knows that when it comes to automation we are using xpath uh, by using xpath uh, we are able to identify the element uh, using you know a dom and uh, once we identify uh, we create those repository and we use in automation right and we and and when we are doing that at that time again maybe sometimes because of the skill set you are not using or creating a right expert okay now here machine can come and tell you this is the best expert this will work this is not best expert one example of ai second example could be that you have uh, you know xpath which you are writing in your script and maybe there is a deployment happening from the development side uh, your dom is getting changed your locators are getting changed and at that time again you are uh, you know ending up with a lot of maintenance activity and if we have that maintenance activity at the end of the day either you need a time resources to be able to adopt and do the maintenance or you need something which we all know and it's a very interesting topic nowadays is about smart healing like can AI ML go check your changing of the parameter because it's all about the uh, you know design uh, patterns and if they identify there is a change in the design pattern there is a change in object repository then machines can go ML can go there and fix the problem for you so that's another example of a maintenance um, then scaling automation now uh, it could be a little bit tricky that uh, uh, someone may argue that uh, we already have a scaling in automation but honestly when we talk about automation scaling there is a lot of areas uh, needs to be explored and again areas which can be you know improvised so particularly you know i believe that when it comes to scaling uh, the pace is not matching with the automation and again it is because of the limitations of the human but when it comes to machine maybe the ai ml can understand where uh, there is a need of an orchestration uh, where you want to scale quickly what are the you know resources you are in need at runtime and maybe what are the areas where you can you know uh, shut the resources maybe you are not using it so any kind of a scaling orchestration runtime scaling in devops your pipelines you can use you know the ai ml very effectively 
then comes the test coverage uh, and i am taking this point because nowadays and i think it's not only about the quality and finding a defect it's about the product you know uh, the experience right so when it comes to test coverage and now there are a lot of things uh, in the industry like autonomous testing uh, there is a spider ai technology by which what happens is you know uh, you uh, basically uh, use this kind of a ai ml tool uh, you put them uh, into the application you again uh, know what was the baseline image what is your next uh, you know baseline uh, after a baseline what is your next kind of a uh, changed parameter and then if you see there is a kind of a gap right what we can do is we can try to minimize this gap by again using ai ml tools which can identify unhidden or untouched test cases right so uh, and uh, i have taken this example like what end users are using or the way they are using uh, if that kind of a scenarios are missing in the testing that's not a good right that's not a good idea so that is where uh, i wanted to say that uh, aiml can definitely look for that un you know a touch or unlooked uh, potential scenarios which actually your end users are using and then you can also implement or use them in your you know uh, testing uh, you know scenarios or a feature and that's why you can call it as your test coverage is getting you know more and more uh, and that means you are doing more and better quality assurance so i think we understood uh, why we need ai in test automation now let's go back and see what are some of the examples so let me just change the slide okay so now we are going to talk about what are the areas so let me start with the first example which is a self filling of test automation right uh, so when we talk about self filling uh, of a test automation uh, uh, i will try to explain you how it works when we talk about aiml okay so uh, by now we understood uh, there is a change in your object repository uh, i will use maybe a simpler word like uh, there is a change in your web pages okay and that can be technically some html changes or your css changes and when these changes are happening what you want is you want something uh, which is almost you know uh, uh, able to understand this hidden pattern uh, you can use some kind of nlp you can use some kind of uh, ml uh, methodologies by which you want to go back uh, to those kind of uh, changes and you want your aiml to go and fix for you right now this is a very good example of aiml where aiml can detect this uh, you know parameters changes um, then you can train your models okay uh, because now we have output defined already so you can train your model accordingly and then you can deploy the model uh, in a production so that uh, automatically after a deployment if there is any changes right you no need to go and do maintenance by your own rather ai ml can go back to your script and they can do the maintenance activity for you right so that is a very good example of a self filling of test automation uh, now let's go to and see another example what is that ai based api automation testing and test data generation so uh, now here uh, maybe i will start with test data generation uh, uh, when we say about test data generation uh, most of the time and particularly when we talk about a scaling or you want to do a rapid testing you want to do a shift lift uh, you don't have a data and maybe if you have a, you know you you can create a data at that time you don't know what are the areas where really you need data and then which type of data uh, you want to mimic a data you want to clone a data and at that time uh, it's like you have so many requests coming in all of a sudden and you're not able to scale the thing now here again ai ml can come as a rescue hand uh, they can help you in kind of a test data generation and similarly uh, ai based api automation testing right so uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, traditional uh, automation testing happening is around GUI based right uh, but when it comes particularly if I talk about API I, I can you know relate about uh, you know a microservices right so when we talk about microservices and in that kind of a project where you are dealing with a lot of microservices uh, you need to understand uh, you know how the relation is there and I I will probably use a word from ML but how the association is right and to understand this association association hidden parameter you cannot learn and understand full that microservices right but machines can understand and they can tell you these are the association these are the clustering these are the related things so that is how ai based uh, api uh, automation testing or test data generation can help us now let's go and see another example 
spidering ai so spidering is a beautiful uh, you know technology and what it does is uh, the way we talk about spider right so it's like a mesh okay uh, we use this technology and particularly development team uses it a lot and what they do is they just you know use ai ml tool which are enabled with this technology of a spidering the put that application on your web application for crawling and then uh, the things start happening uh, you know gets uh, start about uh, what is a change in your you know a uh, 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 baseline images right so basically it takes all your screenshot your html code snippet and everything and then it goes back and it uh, it compares that what was there in the baseline image if there is any changes it will alarm you and then you as a domain expert you can go back you can check okay if there are any changes is it a bug or is it just you know uh, uh the expected behavior and accordingly uh, you can file a defect and at the same time you can use automation to be able to generate your scenario by ml uh, automatically right so you can take a combination and then you can use spidering technology our uh, development team uses it and uh, that's a very good example of artificial intelligence now Let's talk another thing or uh, visual testing. I think this is one of my favorite. So uh, when we talk about visual testing, uh, that way uh, traditional visual testing used to happen is really changed. OK, uh, so nowadays uh, a lot of computer visions are getting used. Uh, not a lot of uh, sophisticated, you know, deep learning algorithms are there in a picture which are able to find your visual testing. Uh, something out of the topic because it is not related to AIML, but I really wanted to say that, uh, and I have uh, heard somewhere in in some of the conferences that if you wisely use visual testing, right, uh, maybe the the again and again the regression or the things like that which you are doing, you can optimize, right? Uh, because these tools are coming with so much sophisticated way that one line of a code is checking your entire web page, right? And I think if you um, if you you know uh, go the way we do automation right we need to write a lot of lines of code a lot of verification and validation but here uh, when we talk about computer vision and a visual testing right these libraries can detect any changes right and if they can do all this verification more verification then really do we need to write that uh, you know uh, big code no so i'm not saying that let's change the visual testing with that but i'm saying there could be some scenarios where you already have this requirement then why to go with uh, you know another way of writing so much bulky code right um, so that is not related to this topic but i just thought when we are in visual testing so maybe uh, you can think of that fine i want to log in uh, a web page and i want to verify uh, whether a user is having a proper profile or not uh, but hey you know with visual testing i can check entire web page uh, it means i am i am able to check that also right so why you need that kind of a coding right so that is a visual testing and computer vision is getting uh, you know uh, so much use in this area and a lot of uh, uh, tools are there in a the market which are there to do visual testing and they are completely using machine learnings and deep learning to be able to do this sophisticated testing now <clears throat> sorry now comes my favorite uh, autonomous testing so uh, um, maybe uh, i will not try to explain by definition but i will try to explain what it is so you want to create your test autonomously you don't want any you know intervention uh, as such right and when you don't want any kind of such intervention what you want to do is you want to uh, have some kind some kind of a design pattern okay which will be able to understand what is the change in your production and then by looking those kind of uh, you know changes or you know uh, uh, the uh, the schema changes i would probably use the word uh, you will see uh, the baseline image and then you will try to bring that uh, you know uh, scenarios automatically for you so you don't want any intervention you want to generate your scenarios which are missing and here again aiml can come as a rescue hand and can help you to create uh, those kind of uh, uh, test cases autonomously without any human intervention now uh, defect analysis and prevention uh, i don't know why it is so late but yeah uh, i think uh, this is one of the example we all uh, you know are familiar i believe uh, that uh, ai ml can help us to predict right i think the probability is is one of the area where you can put this problem statement uh, you have a lot of data you have different different areas where the defects used to produce you have collected the data 
and then you are trying to understand in the next deployment where there could be a defect so that could be a defect analysis and you know uh, talking or telling about the defect but then comes an interesting part which is a defect prevention right if you want to prevent a defect uh, then you need something different right so you need to go shift left and at the time of deployment you need to have this kind of aml uh, which is uh, you know uh, are un uh, uh, which are there uh, uh, you know able to understand that these changes have already created such kind of a defect and maybe this is not going in a right pattern this is alarming and then you can probably go and you know prevent the defect but defect analysis and defect preventions uh, are uh, particularly uh, a very great and good example of using AIML and uh, if we are using it properly then uh, I think when it when we talk about software testing I think one more uh, problem which we usually uh, come across is about uh, you know where to put resources and energy right so here maybe uh, this kind of things if you are adapting in your traditional software testing um, maybe you are potentially uh, you know allowing resources to be there and then you are using your energy wisely and then maybe you no need to do entire testing right because i i know uh, we talk about um, continuous testing test everything but come on i mean if if you want to uh, you have AIML and if they can tell you what are the particular area where you your you know productivity or your focus is required you will be focusing there right and maybe uh, you can uh, you know the resources um, uh, uh, limited resources even if you have you can actually direct the energy in a right context so that is about defect analysis and prevention um, and similarly I think uh, that was the next point was about you know uh, smart automation suit right so that is what I was talking right so um, it is very important uh, what to taste what not to taste when to taste and all this kind of things only uh, can be answered uh, if you have a data and that's the whole story right if you have a data you will be using data you will be using machine learning algorithms uh, to be able to understand the data uh, Again, if you have an output known, you will be using supervised. If you don't know about it, unsupervised learning, runtime data, reinforcement learning, and then you will be able to, you know, find out what are those smart automation suit, which probably you can use. So I think now uh, it's time to quickly summarize, uh, you know, what we have understood from this topic is about uh, increased AIML based of test automation is is actually happening uh, and uh, a lot of tool are having maybe a few few features uh, which are actually ready with AIML but uh, you know going down the line uh, in some of the years what we are gonna see is a lot of features and a lot of things are actually happening by AIML they are uh, there are tools who are able to tell you the expert who are able to write the script for you who are able to do the maintenance for you so more and more AIML based automation now AIML enhancing various feature in automation tools and framework right depending upon the needs the scalability uh, we have talked about uh, you know the progression automation shift left and where you want to bring your energy right at the time again AIML can be you know enhancing uh, you know various features uh, I think I have missed about the strategy but that can also go there and then uh, what we foresee uh, is a more and more increased demand of uh, the professionals who are there, who understood AIML. And uh, I really believe that uh, if you understand the core concept, then only you can go and really implement it rightly, right? So if we don't know AIML, and that's why I have, you know, I was taking almost five to 10 minutes to explain about what is AIML. Uh, and I was talking more and more about the data because once we understand how it works, then we can relate, okay, that is how it works. So this is an area, uh, maybe I am doing it in a different way, but AI ML works like that. So why not to use it, right? So there will be more and more demand uh, and particularly for automation where, you know, uh, if the folks or uh, architect, if they understand AI ML, I think they can do justice. They can understand what are the areas uh, we should start using uh, with AI ML. And then, uh, quality automation um, uh, and automation for everyone uh, because once we have this kind of uh, AI ML tool if you remember we talked in the evaluation the bulky heavy tool right if you have so much AI ML um, tools will make your life easy uh, to be able to do uh, you know so that everyone can do automation and everyone can get some you know a return of investment out of that and then I want to just, uh, you know, close uh, my presentation with uh, one of the thing that uh, we started with an evaluation. Uh, we are ending on artificial intelligence use cases. And uh, what I see from throughout uh, the technologies, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, evolvement, right? Uh, if the change is for good, right? Let's embrace it, right? So here, uh, if we are wisely, uh, accurately using AML in our software testing, we are taking it for, you know, with the open hand, rightly we are using again, uh, then definitely it is going to give us a good ROI, return of investment and better automation. So if the change is for good, let's embrace the change. So that's it from my end. Uh, now I can go back if we have any questions. So let me just stop sharing the screen. And so, yeah. So, Jenna, I think I'm fine for the questions if we have yeah. any. Yeah. So, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, first of all, a lot mm -hmm. of people said they really enjoyed it. Um, Let's see, Micah said um, she was wondering if there are additional, or excuse me, they were wondering if there are additional materials to study on the subject. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe some communities or video courses you could recommend. All right. So I think uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, LinkedIn groups about AIML. Uh, uh, there is a group from Great Learning. Okay. Uh, you can register for that. And if possible, maybe I will be sharing some of the links uh, which you can register uh, and you can subscribe for them. And every week or uh, bi-weekly, you will get some kind of those materials. Yeah. Perfect. Um, you know, since we have a second and I'm not familiar with it, can you elaborate on Spider AI a little bit more? All right. Yeah, sure. So uh, I will again go back and I will explain you how it works. I think by that you will understand how the technology is. So spidering, the name itself says it's a spidering, right? The meshing, right? So we, uh, you know, development team uses this spidering. So they start on the web application. They put this AIML tool on the web application, consider like that. And what this application does is it scroll through your web application, right? And when it is doing this scrolling, uh, it will take your screenshot. It will take your, uh, you know, HTML example of a coding, coding snippet and things like that. And what we are doing indirectly is we are collecting a data, right? You have collected a data. You have a data, you will use ML algorithm and what you will find it, okay, there is a change uh, in a design pattern. It means there is a, some changes in the object, in the backend. It could be a defect. It could not be a defect. If it is not defect, then it is an unhidden test coverage scenario. Let's create it, right? So that's a beautiful concept of spidering. And then we are connecting that spidering concept with artificial intelligence here. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. I think so. It's almost like AI crawling. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to like connect the dots. I think I got it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, that was fantastic. And as somebody who's really still learning kind of the nuts and bolts of AI, it was it was fantastic to get to see all of these different things kind of presented together because you see it a lot in bits and pieces. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you for being up so late. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, a wonderful platform. I'm really happy that uh, I always believe in, you know, keep learning and keep sharing. So always anything for our QA community. Thanks for a platform, Jenna. And thanks for being a wonderful host here. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you yeah. so much. Have a great night. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. So folks, we have come to the end. Thank you so much for everybody who was here. Um, if you made it the whole two days, give yourself a round of applause. If you just made it to one talk, give yourself a round of applause because it's awesome that you're here. Um, I'm so excited when I see people learning, especially when we kind of learn together and learn in public in this kind of environment. And hopefully one day we'll be learning together in person again uh, because virtual is great, but in person kind of feels really good too. Um, I am so grateful to Zapple for giving us this opportunity. Um, I wasn't super familiar with who they are before they asked me to speak. Um, so of course, went and kind of did my homework and they look super cool. Um, and also for pulling me in as a host, this is this is fun. I always like hosting. Um, this is the longest hosting I've done. I've always done like little four hour blocks. So, you know, it's exciting to see that I could do this. Um, but I'm super grateful for everybody being here, for sharing questions, feedback, thoughts, ideas, for being a part of the, the conversation and being a part of the summit. Um, all of the speakers shared their contact information. It's available on the site as well. So if you have more questions for a speaker that they didn't get to, you can always reach out to them on LinkedIn or by another means if they shared it. Um, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer questions. Um, and of course, you know, if you found something 
super helpful out of this is there was something that kind of connected the dots for you or or taught you something new speakers love to hear that they that they taught that they shared something new that it, it impacted your career in some way um, so of course you know share that back with them as well and I know many of these folks will be at additional conferences and giving other talks at other events so it's always fun when we see the same people because get to talk to you some more um, so again, thank you so, so much for being here. I'm Jenna Charlton. Uh, Zapple Tech has been our kind of host for this event, um, and it's been a wonderful two days. So I hope everybody learned something new and you enjoy the rest of your day and your soon-to-be weekend, and if you celebrate the holidays coming up. Thanks for coming.